Okay, colleagues, let's let's start. Although um, there's only a limited number um, of us here, MEPs, that is. Um, but as we know, all of this is being web streamed. Um, Today we'll have uh, two further sessions in the context of our ongoing inquiry. The first session will be dedicated to the topic of IT security of EU institutions. Um, and the second session will be dedicated to the role of parliamentary oversight of intelligence services at national level in the era of mass surveillance. And it's part three um, of that topic. We've dealt with it before. Um, and unless anybody has any objections, I propose that we adopt the agenda like this and that we, um, we start this session without further ado. We have four experts today and we'll be listening to statements by Mr. Ronald Prince, who's the director and co-founder of uh, Fox IT, a company closely involved in detecting, solving and preventing intrusions and incidents in Europe, including the Belgacom case that was discussed in this uh, inquiry before and some other major cases, so uh, the experts. Then um, Mr. Freddy de Zeure, who is the head of the Interinstitutional Computer Emergency Response Team, otherwise known as CERT EU. And this body is responsible for the IT security of all the EU institutions, so that would include us then, agencies and bodies, and support them to prevent, detect, respond, Response, respond and recover against intentional and malicious attacks that would hamper the integ integrity of their IT assets. Then the third speaker is Mr. Giancarlo Villella, who is the Director General in the European Parliament responsible inter alia for information and communication technology services. And the last speaker today will be Mr. Luca Zampaglione, the security officer of EU LISA, which is the new EU agency for large-scale IT systems. And this agency is managing systems such as VIS, SIS, and Eurodac, which of course contain a lot of sensitive personal data that need to be kept safe and secure. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to do a short introduction um, of maximum of 10 minutes, and after that we'll open the floor to questions and debate, and there will be plenty of time to come back to issues that you may wish to address. Mr. Prince, would you like to do the kickoff, please? Sure, well, uh, thanks for inviting me. I've uh, uh, in indeed did some preparations to, uh, uh, to discuss with you. Um, well, but to first, to start off, uh, uh, indeed we did the investigation within the, the Belgicom and in the Belgicom incident, but uh, I'm not going to, uh, in detail on what happened there, and I hope you can understand that we have an NDA, and I think it's uh, up to my customer to disclose uh, uh, what they want. Um, so I have some general observations I would like uh, to share with you. Um, uh, we are involved, um, uh, we've been involved a couple of times in investiga investigating in uh, uh, espionage cases. And um, what we see there is if we break it down in um, what customers can do uh, in the prevention phase, detection and response. Um, well, we noted something and I want to do this, discuss that with you. Um, for instance, the response phase, that is where we come in within an organization where they have the situation that they think there's an, something fishy going on and they want to understand more what's going on. Uh, we bring in the team, we install sniffing technology, DPI if you like, and find out what's, what's going on there. And um, then a, a costly investigation starts. It, it takes uh, um, uh, lots of resources to find out what's going on within a network or on a network. And uh, what you see there is that typically our customer um, has a different stake there than um, the customer of the customer or, or a government which is using uh, facilities of, uh, of our customer. And um, our customer usually just wants to clean the network and that's what we will do. But then you also see that there's a, a lot of questions which are not going to be answered because there's no um, direct intention uh, to investigate it uh, by the people who uh, who hired us, and so um, we end a lot of uh, a lot of the times our investigation ends with more questions like who did this, what information did uh, the perpetrators obtain, and with what goal uh, went they inside in here, 
And yeah, of course, you can understand that something, um, uh, if you look at a broader scope, is, um, I think it's a pity that we not always can answer these questions. Um, then another thing that's more about the, the detection. Uh, there's a lot of organizations which try to find out what's going on in my network. Uh, as we all know by now, is computers can be hacked, and there's only one way to find out if, if there's a perpetrator in your network, so you have to install uh, a detection environment and run an operation on that. And, um, and what we see there is there's a lot of organizations who have been named in the press recently which uh, um, should have some malware going on, but they do their investigation themselves, and then they say, uh, well, we, we checked, and there's nothing here. Um, please walk on, there's nothing to see here. And uh, that's a bit strange because and on one side we have organizations, intelligence agencies, which spent hundreds of millions to build malware, uh, and which is really focused in uh, preventing to be detected. And on the other side, you have organizations which just bought a box, and the box says there's nothing here, so we are safe. And um, yeah, and that's even with organizations which don't know anything about this special case, they don't have the as we call uh, this technical, the indicators of compromise, and they still are, they, they, they sent out press releases uh, in which they state that they're sure that they're not infected. Well, um, I think that uh, is, uh, then those people who can do that, they can work for my company. Um, and then we, and in the prevention phase, there's also an interesting observation. Uh, we have lots of customers who um, try to get very secure network, and, and we build uh, special equipment for that, and especially in the, in the critical infrastructure environment, so for example, um, uh, power grids. Um, you see that uh, we export a lot of this kind of equipment to all parts of the world, but not uh, into Europe. And, uh, and it's not that we don't try to sell in Europe, but it seems that we're a bit naive here, and we don't think that the cyber war will touch uh, uh, Europe at some point. Um, we also see that the European organizations that are really willing to invest and to become more secure, uh, they have a big issue of, uh, of hiring the, the right people and, and, uh, and uh, purchasing the right equipment. Um, I think one of the reasons could be that, that this, the, the, European, this the European tender system is, um, is doesn't help in there. Uh, they end up with the cheapest solution, which is by definition not always the, the best solution. Um, and I also have some, some uh, visibility on, on, the, on the security industry, which produces, uh, uh, let's say, the end-to-end -end encryption uh, equipment. This is usually being used within each country has such uh, a local industry and they built the products to protect their local governments for their own state secrets. Uh, we also have a, a European thing on that, so there's a list of uh, approved products which is, can, can be used within the EU for EU secret, EU top secret, and EU confidential. And um, I don't think it's really uh, easy for those organizations to purchase this. It's, it's very costly and not that easy to handle, and uh, you as a member of parliament, you wouldn't use these phones, I think, uh, although they are very safe to use or secure. Um, so every time uh, the, the same question pop, pops up for me, how much do we actually uh, care and how much are we, really, uh, are we willing to invest if we want to prevent uh, espionage? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next, Mr. Desure, you have the floor for a maximum of 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me here. I would like to just give a few words of introduction on what CFDU is, what the mandate is, what we are doing, to scope exactly the purpose and the responsibility to take your words. So set of for the European institutions, agencies and bodies, it, it's an interinstitutional task force, and the mandate of the task force is to help the EU institutions to protect themselves better against cyber threats. It's a small team, it's 15 people for the moment. It's a small team of experts, real experts, and we were set up two years ago. It is working under the uh, functional authority of the Director General of Digit in the Commission and under the oversight of an interinstitutional steering board. Now, all of our constitution, uh, constituents, all of our clients, and the clients indeed include the European Parliament and the Commission and the Council and the European Central Bank and the Court of Justice and Eurojust, but also Europol and ESA, and the LISA agency that's present here today, all of these organizations remain operationally responsible for their own networks 
to protect them, to detect things, and to, to make sure that, uh, that everything is running smoothly and, and properly. What we do is we offer additional support, additional help to detect things earlier and to remediate quicker. And we do it with um, an interface to the interinstitutional level and international level. And we work with the best partners that we can find in the member states, in IT security firms, and we cross-correlate between institutions. And this is where we can add added value to what the institutions are already doing right now. So we work very closely with the internal IT security experts in every institution and to, do, to deliver our, our, uh, our purpose. Now, the EU institutions, agencies and bodies, they are very high value targets if you talk about targeted attacks, about cyber threats. And this can be in order to steal privileged political information, in order to steal economic information, or in order to manifest political discontent, hacktivism, but that's, let's say, the lesser problem in the discussion of today. But we are regularly targeted by cyber attacks, that's obvious. So what do we do about it? We have three kinds of services. The first service is preventive services. We help the institution to avoid problems for the future. We help them to determine which are the softwares to be patched. We help them also to learn from lessons of the different in incidents in the different institutions to build better protection mechanisms. In terms of detection, we gather information from different sources, and that can be the institutions themselves when they get attacked. We cross-correlate with the other institutions. We get information from the national certs in the different member states, and we have a very good cooperation with them. And we get information from the IT security industry. And with that information, we send out alerts about potential compromised systems in the networks of our clients. These alerts, the statistics are last year 650 alerts about things that have already happened, meaning a compromised workstation, credentials being stolen, ongoing DDoS attack, uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable systems. And so this information helps the institutions to react about uh, the, the problems that they may have in their, in their organization. They also detect things themselves, and they report this information back to us. And with that information, we can help uh, the constituency to, to react on cyber threats. And thirdly, when there is a serious incident, when there is a serious um, um, infected system in any of the constituents, they can call us in for help, and then we make available our experts in our team. We pool information from the mature institutions and bring in experts from the, more, the bigger institutions to remediate the problems. And also we network with the member states, SERFs, and with the IT security uh, companies as well, and, and one of them is sitting here at the table. Last year, we had 10 such cases in which the CERTU was called in to do incident response coordination, which means it's in kind of major, major kind of, uh, of, of problems. And to summarize, I just want to highlight that the CERTU is still a very young organization, but it's already proven additional added value to the, to the institutions. The added value comes from consolidating, correlating, combining the information that we get from the institutions and from the best partners that we can find in, in the business. And I think uh, what is important to note here is that these 15 people, and we will be growing in the near future, it demonstrates the commitment of the institutions to increase the baseline of their protection against this type of cyber threats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. De Zeures. Third speaker on the list, Mr. Villela, Director General, DG ITEC in the European Parliament. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Je parlerai en français. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I'm going to speak uh, French, and I do apologize for my um, fellow Italians in the Italian booth, but I shall speak French. Well, uh, I'm speaking third here in line, and immediately following the... Uh, gentleman who reported on CERT and it's quite useful for me because the uh, council uh, in working on this uh, area does uh, rely very much on uh, on interinstitutional cooperation uh, the parliament very much relies on uh, cooperation with other uh, institutions uh, we have been uh, following the uh, developments in this area on IT and uh, we have begun to launch uh, actions which go even further than uh, cooperation with the uh, other institutions including Euro the European Commission and CERT.
the Parliament feels that we should be trying to find uh, solutions together, pool our resources. Indeed, we think it would be useful to have a, a structure uh, which is common to all the institutions in order better to protect them. We've made our proposals, uh, DG ITIC's uh, uh, proposals, to the Inter-Institutional Committee, uh, very much along the lines of the uh, proposals adopted uh, in two resolutions by the Parliament um, last July. There were resolutions on um, cyber security passed at that time. And uh, we uh, suggested uh, um, stronger cooperation among the institutions. And we did even suggest that there should be a, a common cloud for the institutions. And ITEC very much uh, supported the uh, Parliament's uh, general view on the operational plan. And we have made a formal proposal uh, to the committee to that uh, end. As uh, chair of the Interinstitutional Committee for IT, uh, it's my role to drive that uh, program through, and I shall be very interested to see the outcome of this inquiry myself. I think that the content of the resolution and the report, which will be the outcome of that inquiry, will subsequently be used in the Interinstitutional Committee for IT. Now, uh, in terms of IT security uh, in the European Parliament and the plan uh, for that, uh, my colleague from the CERT has already um, highlighted the key aspect. Nobody in the world can guarantee uh, IT security to the tune of 100%. Nobody can do it. It's just not possible. What I can tell you is that my DG, DG ITEC in the European Parliament, uh, does uh, apply procedures which are very much in line um, with international standards, the highest international standards. Everything we do uh, meets those international standards. Now, I wouldn't wish to um, overstate my case, but I'm, I'm quite uh, proud of what we've done. We have managed to ward off a number of uh, attacks on our IT systems over the past few years, and I'm pleased that we have managed to do that. I think we can be satisfied that we do meet the standards, but um, at the moment we can't go any further than that. As the gentleman who represented the CERT uh, knows, we are working uh, very closely with CERT to improve the situation. But it really is an ongoing challenge, and we are constantly um, making sure that we update our knowledge and attend the appropriate seminars to learn more about what we can do. Certainly, uh, DG ITIC is in a position now to uh, work out uh, what uh, attacks we might be prone to. And if we do come under such cyber attack, uh, we um, feel that we are in a position to react appropriately. Even though it's rather difficult to react sometimes, um, because of, or thanks to, I should emphasize, the rules on data protection. Uh, so w because of those rules, um, both whichever way you look at it, we are not always free to react in the way we would think appropriate. Now, over the last year or so, DGI Tech has uh, made two uh, specific proposals for action to the Parliament and we're busy implementing what we've suggested now. First of all, we're making a review of the rules, uh, revising the rules that we have already. But above all, we have adopted uh, new rules, fresh rules, in areas where we felt there was a vacuum.
my feeling is that it's extremely important that I have the appropriate legal basis for protecting our IT system, where we need the legal basis to be properly in place and to be um, wide-ranging. The second issue we've been working on is um, IT security being very much mainstreamed into our overall security policy. I'm sure that MEPs are aware of this. Um, DG iTech feel that it's very important that uh, IT security is very much part of our global um, security policy. And that is indeed what's happening. We're making sure that it is an integral part thereof. We are in a position in, in our DG, um, we're in a position to carry out some project independently. So we can work alone on some things. But uh, as is the case uh, in other big institutions, we are not able alone to um, establish uh, the actual IT infrastructure itself. We can't do that alone, so we have to work hand in hand, hand in hand with um, the big technology uh, companies, um, in line with the rules of the financial regulation, of course. So we have to work um, in partnership with them. So that's in broad brushstrokes what uh, DG iTech uh, does, and I'm obviously very happy to answer any more detailed questions if you have any later. But just by way of conclusion, Madam Chair and Mr. Rapporteur. There is one point I wish to stress. DG iTech very much bases its work on interinstitutional cooperation. We want to strengthen that to the, ma to the maximum of our ability. Vilela, I note that you have taken the ultimate security measure and protect your notes because you've handwritten them on, yes. on paper. That's very exactly. good. <laughs> okay, uh, that brings us to the last speaker, Mr. Zampaglione, security officer uh, on the e in the EU LISA agency of the European Commission. You have the floor. Thank you. I have a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm not in charge of the... Ah, there it is. There it okay. is. So, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Luca Zampaglione, a security <coughs> officer of a newborn European uh, uh, IT agency. And I'm here uh, with my hat of interim data protection officer. I take the opportunity to thank you for having invited the agency to touch the current topic of IT security in the EU institutions. I will skim through what the agency does. Then I will also give a brief description on the three IT systems that we operate. Then I will mention which is the security model that controls the agency and the FRATI systems. And then I will uh, try to make uh, final recommendations on how, in our opinion, EU institutions could improve the current status of IT security. ULISA has been established uh, by an EC regulation, 1077-2011, uh, and uh, it is the uh, management authority of uh, large-scale IT systems in the justice, uh, freedom, and security area, principally the Schengen Information System 2, the Visa Information System, and the European Dactyloscopic System, EuroDAC. The agency is, yes, responsible for re-operational management and security of the central systems, but is also responsible of the uh, communications network, that is actually the piece of wire that uh, connects uh, the central systems to the national systems. Just to give you some uh, figures, the Schengen Information System uh, 2 is uh, connected to 30 Schengen area states and uh, to Eurojust and uh, soon to Europol and it is uh, interconnected to uh, several uh, law enforcement national networks. The visa information system covers 29 states, 
and mainly interconnected to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs networks. And uh, the central systems directly reach uh, uh, several world regions, uh, like uh, today Africa and the Middle East. And soon uh, it will also reach South America and Russia. The European dactyloscopic system for asylum uh, covers 32 uh, EU countries. It is mainly connected to immigration services. As you see, there is a, a capillar uh, interconnection of the three large-scale IT systems to national networks uh, and in cascade also to, to other regional uh, uh, portions of our uh, world. I mentioned at the end and the communications network, meaning the communication network is not a system, but it is the common secure transport vector and it is the minimal common denominator of the three IT systems because, as I said before, it is a piece of wire that connects in a secure way the three systems to the national networks. The security model is uh, uh, based uh, on, a simple, uh, on a simple hierarchy. There are, uh, there are EC regulations. Uh, there is a legal base. Security is written black, black and white, and uh, uh, it is foreseen uh, both by the agency regulation and also for each IT system, which are the security requirements, the specific security requirements to which each IT system uh, has to obey to. So the legal base is uh, undoubtable uh, the, the driver for us to, to implement security in uh, our uh, agency. The year achieved for us is that uh, below the uh, legal base, uh, we build uh, security plans and uh, related uh, security policies and procedures in a way to have an end-to-end hierarchical adopted set of uh, uh, procedures. ULISA is uh, also developing uh, a risk management framework because, uh, uh, of course, the requirements coming, deriving from law cannot be the only ones. Actually, as it was mentioned before by the colleague of uh, DJI Tech, we also implement standards, uh, information security standards, in a way to uh, have a, a good uh, uh, guideline on how also to implement the technically uh, security. The security model, from a more technical viewpoint, foresees uh, some <coughs> basic principles that actually work. The three central systems are technically conceived to be not connected to the Internet but only to authorize the institutional networks through controlled national interfaces. The agency is uh, responsible of uh, physical uh, interconnection with the member states in the member states defined as demarcation point. So the agency is responsible for the security starting from the central systems down to the interconnection uh, with the wire directly in the member states. From that demarcation point onwards, the member states are fully responsible for the security of their national networks, where the three large-scale IT systems provide their informative services. As you can see from the three bullets, actually this uh, uh, is an implementation of what is foreseen by best, uh, also by best uh, security uh, practices and also by the uh, international standards, despite the fact that they are required by uh, the legal base. Now I will uh, switch to the last slide uh, with a, a list of security measures that, uh, in our opinion, will, uh, can contribute to improve the security status of the IT, system, uh, uh, IT systems of the European institutions. Actually, four main areas for IT security improvements can be identified in the following. The first is uh, set IT security standards at EU level for an end-to-end -end approach. Actually, I heard before from a colleague uh, sitting close to me, end-to-end. -end. I heard also from a colleague of uh, DG uh, IT uh, standards. 
This is a repetitive concept. Good. So there is a, for us a need for a technical EU body able to follow up and implement such standards and recommendations involving EU institutions and or national operating authorities to guarantee an homogeneous and acceptable level of security with a global end-to-end -end view. In poor, in poor words, to have uh, an end-to-end -end security from uh, central systems where the databases are actually uh, residing, down to the uh, end user that consumes the information that is, uh, uh, that is stored in the, central, in the central systems. The second point as a recommendation for improvement is to develop a standard risk assessment process to assure a cost-effective implementation of security measures and privacy controls to be included in systems designed for quantitative allocation of proper budget and resources. To make a long story short, to find the right countermeasures that are cost-effective and actually protect information in the right way. Uh, information has to be protected with appropriate security measures. Not, uh, not the wrong ones, but the good ones. And the only way to achieve this is through an appropriate risk assessment process. By this way, it is possible to achieve the famous principle of security and privacy by design. Third recommendation is to include in the EU institutions IT systems life cycle, a repetitive process for security certification and recertification. By analogy, like we do with uh, our own car when we bring it to the, to the, technical, uh, to the technical checks, in a way that uh, no, we know that uh, the, when the IT systems become old and used, they also become more vulnerable to new threats especially when the level of risk is uh, high, uh, taking as an example uh, IT systems that are directly connected to the Internet. Last, last uh, recommendation is uh, to consider uh, identity management and uh, information labeling uh, as uh, uh, two uh, concepts to be integrated between each other. So the recommendation is to implement uh, strong authentication mechanisms integrated to information labeling to assure that information is uh, actually accessed and made available at any time by whomever needs to have access to it and not to unknown parties. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zampaglione. Um, now I'm going to open the floor for uh, questions and debate. However, if you'll allow me one general remark, in particular to the last three speakers, or actually only to the last three speakers. Um, okay. I mean, the, the NSA has no limits, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, now, I, I would like to point out that we are conducting an inquiry here uh, into allegations of massive snooping, mass surveillance, spying, bugging, eavesdropping. Um, we've had a special session here uh, about Belgacom, which has probably affected the European Parliament. If I look at the, the, the material, the programs that we're using and, and equipment we're using, you know, there are Microsoft, Apple, the, all the industries we had earlier this week. So I would really like to hear in your, in your answers a little bit more um, about, you know, what's going on here. We would like to get answers about, you know, to what degree we've been affected, whether you've, whether, you know, if you have detected it, if you've not detected it, and if not, why not? That's the kind of information that we would like to get. Because if, I, if I've listened to your presentations, that's all about um, you know, prevention measures, and that's all very well, but clearly it didn't work. Because the forces out there, if you want, are bigger than this. So that's the kind of questions that we want answers to. Um, 
But I'm going to start by uh, our rapporteur, uh, Claude Moraes. You know the routine by now. Every speaker gets two minutes, and two minutes strictly, for asking questions. Please specify uh, which of the panelists you're addressing your question to, and then uh, one by one the panelists will answer. Then next one, yes, Timothy, all the, the shadows will get the floor, no worries. Um, and then if we have time, there will be a second round of questions and answers. And if it's, if it's really... Uh, uh, you know, I'll allow follow-up questions if there's really something very specific. Claude, you have the floor. Okay. <clears throat> Taking my cue from that, I'm happy also for my questions to be answered along with others. Um, but taking my cue from that, I mean, it's also my impression that we're trying to inquire in this session, uh, first of all, what may have happened, whether the allegations, not just um, the recent allegations, um, from Snowden about the spying um, of EU institutions, but also um, just to mention, of course, there were allegations five years ago um, of the, the Council of Ministers building and um, the uh, calls of being tracked to the building in NATO, also those um, allegations, um, whether you, know, you have any views on that or whether security was strengthened in relation to those particular allegations. And it's our inquiry which is at least trying to establish some uh, form of timeline or some uh, form of connection between those allegations and whether you have strengthened security, whether you've reacted to um, this kind of um, situation. So we're not inquiring in a vacuum in terms of what your general uh, work plan is in relation to all four speakers. So that's my first question. Coming to this inquiry, um, have you reacted either in abstract or specifically to these allegations? Have you investigated them? I mean, what has been your uh, work plan? Secondly, uh, to, um, to Mr. Prince, um, I know you were limited in terms of the, what you're saying about the Belgacom case, and I appreciate that, but if you could say a little bit more um, about the Belgacom case, we, we had invited you at the time, but you were not able to come, then please say what you can, although I, I know you're limited on that. To Mr. Zamplioni, um, on the CIS2 and Eurodac um, situation, again, uh, you went into some detail about the uh, improvements um, that you had set out, but I want to connect that to the allegations before the summer that the SIS2 uh, system was in fact hacked. So is, is the last part of your um, presentation in reaction to what had happened before summer, or is it just part of a, a general work program? I mean, what, what is this in reaction to? And was there evidence of hacking of the SIS2 system in Eurodac? I mean, will I just limit it there? I, mean, I have other questions, but I mean, just let, just let me limit my questions to there for the moment, because I know other colleagues have got questions. But I think the, the, the common denominator of some of the questions you'll hear are, you know, what happened? Um, are, are you reacting in the abstract? Thanks. I'll first call Mr. Prince. Uh, yeah, I can make this short, actually. You know, I, I'm, maybe if you have direct questions about Bel Bel Belgacom case, I can try it, if I can see if I can answer them, but I'm not going to, uh, okay. to help you on that. If you uh, blink uh, twice, it's yes. If you blink three no, 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 times, no. it's no. <laughs> Just look at how I'm smiling. Yes, but, okay. okay, Mr. Zampaglione. Yes, uh, thank you. But the, the Schengen Information System 2 uh, actually has not been hacked because it entered into production uh, in uh, April this year. Uh, the fact uh, is uh, related to the former Schengen Information System 1 that was not uh, under uh, operational management of the agency. The agency became responsible of a new system starting from April. But uh, what I can say is that uh, we have been uh, strongly interested to what's going on with the Schengen Information System 1 incident because uh, the first question was, okay, uh, the two systems are completely different, uh, but what uh, can we learn from the incident uh, uh, of the SAS-1? So uh, what we did, we announced uh, a, a, a security end-to-end -end review of the Schengen Information System 2 uh, during summertime. 
uh, together with the commission, uh, uh, we, uh, the commission called uh, uh, to a meeting of uh, all the heads of the national police on the 11th uh, of July. And it has been agreed uh, uh, to uh, set up a um, uh, urgent uh, security uh, plan in response of the, of the incident of the SS1 to verify if uh, uh, Shanghai Information System 2 is vulnerable to the same uh, vulnerability uh, that has been exploited uh, by the hacker that uh, uh, dumped uh, the copy of the former Shanghai Information System 1. Today, we are reviewing uh, the results of uh, a questionnaire that has been sent out to the member states, and we will be able to provide an answer in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, that brings us to the next shadow, Mr. Foss. Yeah, vielen Dank. Um. Thank you. Mr. Prince, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I would nonetheless like to ask a supplementary question. Perhaps I'll put the question differently. I read that there was a trace leading towards the UK. Is uh, that to correct what I read or not? Uh, perhaps we could have a confirmation of that. And I don't want to put you in an awkward situation, but it would be important for us to know uh, what exactly the background is, what is known about the background from the point of view of how professional it was, what you detected or discovered? Is this something that somebody could um, you know, put together in their garage or is it something where somebody would need more thorough knowledge? What kind of quality are we talking about? That would be important for us to know. And on the other three speakers then. What I would like to know, when the whole thing emerged that uh, there had been uh, some tapping of uh, information, what kind of uh, inspections were carried out? Was there some kind of technical check or safety check? Is it possible to um, identify when someone has connected into the system and information has been drawn down. Has there been more, if it is the case, do we need more investment in infrastructure? And as we all come from the administration, what do you need in order to do that? Do you need a new budget line, more money? What can you suggest to us in the Parliament uh, that we could do to make the Parliament and the EU more safe, something that we could perhaps include in our report. But I would be interested to know uh, what kind of improvements could there be and uh, how are we affected in our daily work. Thank you. You want to reply is by Mr. Prince, Mr. De Zure and uh, Mr. Villela. We'll start, we'll start with Mr. Prince. Okay, well, thank you for the question. Uh, um, yeah. the, um, yeah, you asked about the UK relation, and um, um, yeah, we've seen, of course, the presentation which was there in the, the Spiegel on one Friday they released it, and uh, um, I think that's the only hard thing I've seen that really directs to uh, GCHQ involvement. There's uh, no way by looking into a network that you can directly see where the uh, perpetrator is actually sitting at that point. Um, what really helps is, is more investigation into attribution, uh, what are they trying to steal to. That's usually the way to find out where actually uh, did the perpetrators come from. Uh, there's another way, but then you have to go online and not uh, do, do the investigation, not within the network which was targeted, but uh, on the internet. Uh, but yeah, that's usually not allowed because that means you need to break into other computer systems to find out, and that's something we cannot do, of course. Um, yeah, you had another question about the uh, uh, level of sophistication. Uh, I think uh, Belgium themselves, they declared this was really sophisticated, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's correct. Um, um, and it also... Um, actually, I saw a presentation. I thought I sh should have brung, bring in one slide, actually, that's the, the decision you have to make in how much you want to invest in relation to the type of 
uh, perpetrator. And uh, if th these guys at the other side, they spent uh, billions and billions to break in, um, you need to decide if you uh, at some point are uh, uh, capable of defending yourself against such an enemy. And, um, uh, and so there's a slide and you have to choose uh, where you want to stand. And, uh, being um, an international uh, uh, establishment as itself as the EU is, I think it's really hard to, uh, to protect yourself at the end for the, the most uh, wanted secrets. Okay, thank you. Mr. De Zure. Yes, okay. The first thing that I would like to, to mention is that uh, um, in my introduction, I already hinted at the statistics that we are facing in alerts and in incident response coordination. Basically, it also indicates um, the, the number of things that we detect on our networks and on which we, we react and try to remediate. So this, this was the first thing that I wanted to, to say. I will not be able to go into specifics on specific incidents here. I will not be able to reveal uh, details about a specific incident. But to reply on the more general question, uh, did we check? when things are being revealed in the press or when we are informed by national certs or by other parties, yes, every single information that we get, we check it and we try to find whether this is true or not and whether we can find something in our networks or not. And I will just highlight it with an example uh, to come back on the Belgacom case. The Belgacom representatives uh, uh, a few weeks ago when they were heard in this uh, same committee, they said that they had made available the indicators of compromise um, the way that this happens and in practice is they have made available the indicators of compromise that were identified by the technical help of, uh, of Fox IT. They have made them available through the national authorities in Belgium, means the police, the prosecutor, and then via the police and the prosecutor to the CERT community. The Belgian national CERT, some other CERTs, including CERT EU. What do we do then with such kind of information? We take the technical information and we check in the networks of our clients, that means the Parliament, the Council, the Commission, all the clients that we have. And so the check indeed was done with the information that we have received and from that check we didn't find any evidence of compromised systems using that technical information. And this is just to highlight a little bit the way, the way it works. Every time uh, the institutions or we are informed about a potential compromise, a potential intrusion, if we get, we try to get the information in order to detect it. Of course, there are things that we detect without getting information from, from outside. We detect things on the networks ourselves as well. But everything is checked and, and uh, we, we try to make sure if we find something to remediate as quickly as possible. Uh, another question that you asked is, is it possible to trace whether somebody is wiretapping and if information is leaking from the organization, it's very, very difficult uh, to, to trace it if you, if you don't know it. I mean, if you know that it's there, of course, it's more easy. If you have already an indication, indication that something is wrong, you may, you may be able to, to trace if information is leaking. But in the absolute uh, value, it's very, very difficult. And also, I would like to uh, reiterate what Ronald Prince has said. It's not possible, um, I think, uh, even with more budget, it's not possible to get 100% assurance that nobody can get into your network, especially if you are uh, facing adversaries that have uh, budgets that are even, even more important or 10 times or 100 times more important than, than what we have. Of course, the last question is what to do more? Yes. Uh, we are on a path to increase the baseline every single time. Every time we learn something from an incident, inside or outside, we raise the level of the protection. And the raising the level means uh, sometimes cost, hardware, software. It means also cost in staff, recruiting staff, increasing the IT security in the institutions. And that is certainly something that, uh, that we can work on in the future. And related to that, to amplify or uh, uh, leverage the investment that is made in hardware and in software and in information exchange is a better interinstitutional inter cooperation. And I come back to what Mr. Villela has said before. And so a strong political support for that interinstitutional cooperation, for the exchange of information between the institutions, is something that is, is certainly welcome. And if I, if I may, one last word uh, to just close. I think some of the things that we try to establish on the level of the EU institutions is very much in line with the EU policy 
on uh, mandatory reporting and uh, cyber security policy, the, the policy that was uh, presented at the beginning of the year, which means establish competent uh, groups uh, that, that get information about incidents, that handle this information, exchange the information between competent groups, between sets in the member states, sets in the member states, etc., having competent bodies that can, can react on it and react on it quickly and, and, and fast. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Villala. You have anything to add? Yeah. <coughs> oui, volontiers, merci beaucoup. Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. I'd like to answer the direct question which was put to me by the three members. What do we do on a day-by-day -day basis and what should we do to improve? On the day-to-day, -day, I did try in my introduction to emphasize how we worked. We engage in daily monitoring of events throughout the system. Whenever a warning flashes up, if an alarm bell rings, and it might be that there's an underlying problem, we make two interventions. Firstly, directly to see if there's a real problem, a simple problem that can be rectified straight away, or the second scenario is to get in touch with the CERT or the OU for a deeper analysis of uh, possible problems. And Mr. Zappaglioni has talked about certain criteria and methods. Well, when I was talking about the methods and standards used by DG ITEC, that's precisely what I'm talking about, the sort of thing that probably we need to improve, but along those lines. In respect of the other questions, there was a direct question about Belgacom. Well, yes, DG ITEC has worked on an in-depth analysis of our structure to establish whether there were any repercussions from what was going on in Belgacom. And I can assert now, after an extensive in-depth analysis, that we detected no problem or malware infecting the Parliament's systems. The second question which was raised was whether we need to invest more money. Well, I don't think we need to go too far in that sort of investment. I would say we have very high caliber experts. Uh, international specialisms are reflected there. Of course, more investment always helps, but I would say that's not the vital point. In my point of view, and uh, this would be my suggestion, and it's for the committee to see whether to accept it, is to focus on the vital point I raised in my initial introduction, namely to enhance inter institutional cooperation. We need to go further in data exchange. I think we need to identify hard and fast joint activities. For example, although it wouldn't be adequate in itself, it might do a lot to reduce the impact of uh, harmful external acts if we had a common cloud a common cloud in which we could locate various structures. That would be preventive defence rather than ex post defence. Um, now I'm, I'm switching, I'm putting up my, my cap as a shadow of the elder group and I'd, I'd like to, to step, things, step it up a little bit. Because I, I get a lot of answers which, I, which say a lot about procedures and, and bureaucracy, but very little about what has happened. Now, 
that is maybe not surprising. If I hear Mr. Mr. Prince say that they say the other side, whoever they are, have spent billions and billions, whereas we have you know, a team of you know, a handful of people who have to build up defenses against this. So that's a lost battle from the start. Um, and I have a couple of very specific questions. I'll start with Mr. Prince. I first have a question regarding uh, SWIFT, and then I'll, I'll move to Belgacom. Um, just a simple question. Do you agree with the Dutch government that the alleged unauthorized access to the SWIFT server in the Netherlands can be investigated properly without an on-site, let's say, forensic technical investigation? Uh, and do you think that the, uh, the, the Dutch Data Protection Authority, together with the Belgian Data Protection Authority, are uh, adequately equipped to carry out an investigation and, and bring out the truth? Um, second question about Belgacom. Uh, Belgacom told us this is a, a massive attack of unprecedented sophistication, and you've said you know, similar words, yet... No personal data have been affected. We cannot find any evidence that um, you know, communications have been intercepted. People spending billions and billions and billions, and yet there's no evidence of compromise. Somehow, I cannot square that, that, that circle. Something doesn't add up here. Why would anybody spend billions and billions in order to get nothing? That doesn't make any sense at all to me. Um, then Mr. De Zure said, well, you cannot give us any specifics about the Belgacom case. Well, I would like to hear specifics, in particular as it may have affected the European Parliament. And, you know, it would make sense to me that it would have affected the European Parliament. I would like to understand, did you detect, um, you know, let's say, what was going on with the Belga case? Was it, did you detect it or did you learn about it and then you started to investigate? Um, now, I've already mentioned that we, we've had some, some speakers from uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Yahoo, all the, the bigger, Apple, there's been contacts with Apple. Uh, have you, following the events or the incidents at Belgacom, have you started an investigation of how Microsoft, for example, um, I don't know, may have created backdoors, may have compromised their systems? I mean, what, what else is, is coming at us? Um, how, uh, yes, very specifically to, to Mr. Prince, because you say you can answer maybe to specific questions. Is there anything that makes you believe that European Parliament communications have somehow been accessed, intercepted, monitored, or otherwise compromised? Um, well, I'll, I'll stick to those questions. I have, I have more, but uh, I'll, I'll stick to this. I'm going to ask Mr. Prince to answer first, and then Mr. De Zure. Uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, well, first answer um, is you asked if, um, uh, if you can do an investigation to see if NSA is inside just by looking at some documents. No, you cannot. Uh, you have to really look into the technical systems. Uh, the second question was about uh, is, um, is the, the, the CBP, the Data Protection Office of the Netherlands, are they, do they have uh, enough technical skills to, to do this kind of investigation? Well, I heard yesterday on the, on, the, on the radio an interview with the head of it, and he said he's going to hire technical staff. Um, so they acknowledge that they need some extra uh, experts in there. Uh, your third question was, um, well, I wrote the answer, no comment, but I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, that, may have been, that may have been several questions then. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I think it was about... Um, mm, mm, uh, I, I definitely asked if... Well, if, two, if, two if questions. you were targeted? If, if uh, any, let's say, communications or data of yeah. the European Parliament may have been compromised in any way. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not going to answer that. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. And then the final question was, does it make any sense that any actor, whatever, whoever that actor may be, spends, and I quote, billions and billions, and then there's no evidence 
of compromise. Does that make sense? Oh, that's an easy one. No. <laughs> no. Okay, I thought it was me. Mr. De Zure. Yes. Okay, thank you. So your question that your question was that we detect SRTU or the institutions that we detect the problems in Belkacom, the answer of course is no. I mean the detection of the incident in Belkacom was uh, was explained to you by the Belkacom representatives uh, a few weeks ago. Um, what we did do is as soon as we found out about the incident in Belkacom is to check whether this had an impact on the EU institutions and I can think of two different impacts. One is if the adversary by having access to the Belkacom network could have eavesdropped on the communications of the EU uh, staff or the MEPs and we have no means to check whether this has been the case or not. Uh, Belkacom has said that there was no impact on customer data and they've told you in the, in the session here and they have told the EU institutions as well. So in other words, for the moment, to the best of our knowledge, there has been no impact on client data and therefore not on the communications of our staff or the MEPs. Second angle into this is if the malware that has infected the uh, installations of Belkacom had an impact on the EU institutions, and I've tried to answer in my previous uh, answer to this, is that with the elements, technical elements that we have received from the investigation, we have checked and we didn't find any impact on the EU institutions. Now, uh, I have to say that all of this uh, investigation in the Bagacom cases is also a judicial investigation ongoing. It's in the hands of the prosecutor, as you may know. And so it is already very, very complicated to talk about it at all. And I have to say that we are quite fortunate that the prosecutor in the Balkacom case and the police in the Balkacom case have allowed the communication of those technical indicators of compromise to us and to a number of other parties to try to check in their networks whether there was any impact uh, at all. And so um, I understand your point that it's difficult to accept the answer. We cannot comment or we cannot give you more details or we cannot be more specific. Um, the positive angle into this is that we have been able to do things, number one, this is the most important thing for us, and number two, we are able to tell you uh, with some level of assurance that for the moment we have no indications of impact on the networks or on the data of, of the EU institutions. Now, I, you had a second question on the, uh, Microsoft, Apple, and all the other softwares and potential backdoors. Um, the we are not aware of any deliberately implanted backdoors in any of these software products or hardware products that the EU institutions are using. Now, are there no backdoors? We honestly don't know. Uh, we are certainly not aware that they have been deliberately implanted by any of these vendors in the products that, that we use. Are these products vulnerable? Do they have ways to penetrate into these products? The answer is yes. And every week, every month, uh, Microsoft is having a patch Tuesday where they communicate to the users of the software things to change into the products in order to close the open holes in, into the software. And this week this was again the case and there was a, a very important uh, vulnerability that was discovered, in fact, uh, last week and that created a lot of buzz in the IT security community that opened the Internet Explorer software and there is a way to get through it and to in fact infect computers of users that are using Internet Explorer. So basically uh, in a nutshell this this vulnerability was discovered last week. Uh, it was patched this week by Microsoft for anybody that has taken care of patching the software they use but it's already uh, quite sure that this vulnerability of Internet Explorer was used for probably months if not a year or more, by people that knew about the vulnerability. Now, the people that knew about the vulnerability, could that be state actors? Possibly, yes. Could that be criminals? Possibly, yes. The point that I want to make is that uh, we don't think, we don't know, but we have no evidence that this kind of vulnerabilities has been crafted into the software by Microsoft or by any of these vendors that we buy software products from. Uh, are there uh, vulnerabilities? Yes, and as soon as they get known and publicized, we as institution, we have to make sure that these patches are made
to the infrastructure that you use in order for these uh, vulnerabilities to be to be closed and in order for your systems to be safe Okay, thank you very much. I, we have two more speakers in this, this round, so I, I apologize to uh, the next panel, but we'll be running a few minutes late. Uh, next, uh, Jan Albrecht of the Greens. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here to all of you. Uh, first question uh, to the representatives of the institutions. Uh, has there been, have there been uh, specialized stuff doing penetration tests on the systems um, and uh, how often these tests are positive. Uh, could you say something on that <coughs> so that successful <coughs> penetrated the systems? And have you alerted the institutions um, or other security Institute, uh, authorities like the Belgian police about possible cyber attacks to investigate in these. Um, then to Mr. Prince, um, can you confirm that um, during British public holidays and lunchtime there was significantly less activity from the attackers which you detected? And can you explain why GRX routers are especially, especially interesting target for intelligence services, or could be? And to all of you, what can you say about the attacks on Belgacom, especially how exactly is the European Parliament's or the European institution's infrastructure connected to the BICS, the alleged service owned by Belgacom? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll take the panelists in the, uh, the initial order. So, Mr. Prince first. Yeah, tough questions again. Uh, no, I don't know anything about holidays or lunchtime. And, uh, and yes, every router is interesting for an intelligence agency to monitor. So, also the GRX. Yeah. Okay. That was uh, sharp and crisp. Short and crisp. Uh, Mr. De Zure. There's not much that I can say on, on these questions. Uh, I, 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 I honestly, I cannot go into specifics on how the institutions, what are the measures that they take in order to protect their systems? What are the type Why? of things? We are the parliament. We should have the right to know if the institutions have called for an investigation on possible cyber attacks, aren't we? I think your question was specific on if we, have the, if we are doing penetration tests and how often we the do first them question, and how positive the outcome is. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give specifics on how we test our systems, how we make sure that they are not penetratable. And it's not only towards you as a potential user of our systems. I mean, we are here in a public audience. And well, we, are not, we are not only a potential user. We are uh, holding okay, the responsibility. Okay, let's, for we're go we're okay. going to repeat the question to Mr. De Zure about whether a judicial investigation has been requested. Uh, on what? No. And, but you have to specify what you mean. I mean, do an, an investigation requested on the basis of press reports or, or on what basis? On the basis of something we found on our networks? Yes, of 40,000 uh, 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 sheets presented uh, by some journalists uh, from uh, the source of Edward Snowden, I would expect that if there's such uh, incidents been alleged also in the European institutions that there's an alert to the security authorities. So if you tell me there's not, I'm okay, but that's an important information for us. I, I have to uh, be specific on what, what uh, I answered. I mean, on the basis of these press reports, the Commission or the other institutions did not uh, report anything to the police, and I don't possibly think we should have. I mean, I think if there is a question about reporting something to the police or to the judicial authorities or to any competent body, it is about something specific that you see on your network, if there is an intrusion, if there is a, a potential impact, a damage, something stolen, something broken. For the moment, we, we cannot in any way report or launch a procedure on the basis of, of something that is uh, alleged in, in the press. Mr. Villela. We 
Je pense que je peux répondre un peu plus librement. Perhaps I feel a little freer to respond on this. I can talk about the Parliament's uh, telephone system. We have a service provider in the three uh, places where we work, in our three, loca three locations. We have a, a contract with Belgacom, with Orange, Orange, and Bost in uh, Luxembourg. It's a contract in all three locations. And so we are dependent on the networks uh, of those three companies. So everything outside uh, with the Parliament cannot be uh, monitored or controlled by the Parliament. However, we also have our own internal communication system. So for uh, any internal communication, where you're talking about one building or, or several linked building, we do have a, a secure communication system which is encrypted as well, secure and encrypted, and it cannot be um, affected by uh, anybody from the outside world. So if you're talking to other MEPs on the internal communication system in this building or the other buildings in Brussels, in Strasbourg or in Luxembourg, uh, then all of this is something which is uh, under our control and DGI Tech, and it will be encrypted so it is protected from the outside world. As for warnings, Mr. Albrecht, yes, we uh, check on this every day. Uh, we check on everything that's been going on. And if we spot something, if we detect something which has happened, or even if we suspect there has been some kind of interference, some kind of intervention, then we pass that information on to the security department, the security directorate within the parliament. And it's the security people that uh, have the power to um, take further steps who may refer this to the police or to the courts, to the judiciary. As far as I'm concerned, I would, of course, inform our political um, powers that be if it's something very serious. And the third thing, of course, is that we would certainly inform CERT EU uh, to check uh, whether anything else is happening uh, elsewhere in, in the other institutions, whether similar things have been going on so that we can organize a rapid response uh, with them. Thank you. Actually, I can ask uh, just to your first question. If uh, we have uh, staff doing a penetration tests, yes. Uh, because it is part of uh, our risk management process to have uh, an end-to-end -end security of the IT systems. So we start with a list of countermeasures, we implement them, and then we verify their effectiveness only through a vulnerability assessment and a penetration test, because that's the only way to understand if uh, a system is actually secure as it, uh, has, uh, as it has been conceived and, uh, yeah, if it is able to provide the right protection to information. As I mentioned before, our IT systems are not connected to the Internet, and this is already a, a good uh, strength. However, uh, we apply the self-protecting uh, protecting node uh, principle in a way that uh, even if uh, networks are connected to national networks, uh, we consider the networks uh, untrusted. So uh, also uh, due to the recent uh, incident with the uh, Schengen Information System 1, we are running uh, a a review of the security of the Schengen Information System 2, and we are in these days running a penetration test of the Schengen Information, 2, uh, Schengen Information System 2 at the central level to verify if uh, the initial strengths that were uh, uh, um, set up in April are still first in place, and secondly, to verify if they are still uh, effective. For what concerns uh, our new office infrastructure, uh, actually our business network, so the, the agency network uh, to interact uh, not only with the public but also with the, uh, other EU institutions, we also follow the same uh, uh, security certification principle where a penetration test uh, is uh, the final stamp to provide uh, the, go, uh, the, go, the go live. So no penetration test result 
positive result, no go live for the system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then the, the final question is for Mrs. Ernst, and if we can all be a bit concise in answering the questions, then we can finish, uh, uh, say, in, 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 in five, six, seven minutes and try to keep the uh, uh, try to keep our uh, our, our, um, our stick to our schedule well we're not sticking to our schedule we're overrunning but try to limit that this is Ernst thank you well I don't know we've got to the point where we're talking about ourselves and I don't know whether we can simply say that uh, you, we only have five minutes left and it's a time for a couple of quick questions. I don't really agree with that and I don't agree with what has been said several times here which is that uh, we can't, we have to simply accept a, a general uh, statement and that we can't ask about the details. I think that's not enough for me. Just to come back to encryption, could you give me a specific answer to the following? Why do members, staff, of all kinds here in the European Parliament not automatically have a GPG key in order to read encrypted mail and send encrypted mail. Why is that not the case? What justification can you give for that? Is that deemed to be correct? Secondly, Mr. De Zure already talked about how many people are employed in the IT area. That's fine. I'd like to know how many staff deal with IT security here in the Parliament or is it or is it all are the different categories mixed together? I'd like to hear from Mr. Villela on that. Are there independent audits carried out? And are there any penetration tests carried out? Have they ever been carried out? Uh, are they being carried out now? That is um, obviously key when we're talking about whether we have security or not. And then finally, still here in the European Parliament, can you really exclude the possibility that there have been successful attempts so that there could be in the future and that could mean that the perpetrator could use data from one institution to penetrate another institution? Is that something that you can completely exclude, that that, that can simply not happen? So using one institution as a vehicle for spying on the other, can you tell us that that is absolutely not possible? What do you do to detect malware and viruses? I'd like to know specifically what you do there. Then on transparency, if there, are, if there were to be an attack on the EP, or if there are attacks, uh, who is informed? At what point and with what level of detail? Is there a notification obligation? And under what conditions would a group or members be informed about such incidents? What exact information would they receive? How uh, safe are in-camera meetings? I'd also like to know that. We have in-camera meetings all the time here. That is something that I would be very interested in hearing an answer to. So there's a lot. I have a lot of questions for you, and I think that you owe us a response to those questions. Important question. The question about the penetration test has already been asked by Jan Albrecht, uh, and we didn't really get a, a full reply. Uh, and I don't think that by sitting here much longer we're going to get more detailed replies. And I think there are also some general questions uh, about security which are not which are important but not relevant for the inquiry. So I'd, I'd really like to ask the gentleman to focus in particular on the, the elements that uh, are relevant for the inquiry. So you ask questions to Mr. Villela, Mr. De Zure, basically. Yeah, Mr. Villela. Oui, merci beaucoup. Eh? Thank you. These are all absolutely relevant, important questions. In terms of the e-signature, as you know, we recently inaugurated e-signatures this is not at all in use 
well, let's say it's in use in a pilot phase. It hasn't yet become a widespread tool, the reason being precisely the point you raised. We need to define the security levels required when using e-signatures. If I can turn to penetration tests, yes, we carry out such tests. We do so on an ongoing basis. We also try and conduct these checks with CERT. If you think, however, it would be useful to take it a step further and have an audit, I'm talking about an external audit, I think that might be a good idea. Nonetheless, we regularly carry out tests on the level of security and of penetration of the system, but it's not an external audit. I'm very open and indeed very positive towards having an external audit looking at security tests, but there I would need to add if you're confining yourself to Parliament it might not be useful. It would be useful however to do that sort of exercise with the other institutions, at least the two bigger institutions uh, in so far as Parliament's work is concerned which is Council and Commission. That in fact enables me also to answer the third question that you raised If we're 100 percent sure uh, that we can't work through other institutions uh, to attack our system, or they can't work through other institutions to attack our system, well, no, we're 100 percent certain, but the systems that we put up with the help of CERT EU are intended to provide alarm alarms or warnings about what's going on. And that does happen. If there was an incident in another institution, such as the Commission, Parliament would be warned immediately that that incident had occurred, and we would immediately take measures to fend off uh, the same sort of attack against us in Parliament. That has worked. as a protective mechanism. It has worked, but I can't exclude it 100%. Uh, I received the four uh, questions. I, I, I know, but we're, <laughs> we, we're, we, we are on the I time constraint, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. De Zure. Yes, very quickly on two of the, of the points. One is on encryption of uh, PGP encryption or any other way of encryption. It's, it's not very easy to implement. Uh, I mean, and we, we live it every day, uh, even on the communication between the experts. It's difficult to implement encryption methods. And in other words, it would be very nice if we would have a more easy to implement solution that would safeguard emails or telephone calls or files in an encrypted manner. And I would immediately jump to the second one is how do you detect malware? How do you detect intrusions? We detect it with the most sophisticated uh, products that we have on the market hardware and software, and information that we can get. However, most of these software products and hardware products, and also the information and also the incident response in any of these cases is very, uh, what I say, concentrated in one geographical part of the world, which is not Europe. And so if there is anything that I, from my perspective, could suggest in terms of outcome of the whole uh, discussion in this very important committee, is that, that the technical solutions to organize encryption, to have network uh, safeguards, to have detection mechanisms for intrusions and malware, and, and to, to have the response of it, to have a, a secure cloud, as uh, Mr. Villela has said before, not only on the level of the institutions, but also uh, on the level of, of the countries. I mean, to have this with European companies, European solutions, that, that would be a great, a great outcome that would help us all in, in the future, I think. 
Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this session with uh, almost 20 minutes uh, delay, for which I apologize. I, uh, I thank the, the panelists for their, uh, their input. Um, I'm sure that we're going to, uh, to draw some, some useful conclusions from this session, even if I'm not the least bit reassured. I'm actually more worried than at the start. But um, I think it's an, important, an, an interesting input to the budget debate where, you know, the, the budget is, is cut more and more and more, but if I listen to what uh, our, our enemies are investing, then the question is if, uh, if we shouldn't be investing more in, uh, in security, uh, if, if at least we want any kind of, um, you know, r remotely serious protection. So thank you all very much, and I invite uh, the panelists of the next panel onto the podium. And as they're joining us, and the name tags will be changed. Okay, colleagues, um, we're going to, to go to start uh, session two, the role of parliamentary oversight of intelligence services at national level in an era of mass surveillance, part three. Sounds a bit like uh, EP Inquiry, the sequel. <laughs> Rocky three, EP Inquiry three. Um, actually, I would propose, if that is okay, with the, with the panelists to, to, um, to merge the two parts of this, uh, of this session and listen to the, the three speakers first and then we, we, we ask questions. So first we welcome uh, to the right of uh, Antoine, Mr. Armand de Decker, Vice President of the Belgian Senate and member of the Monitoring Committee of the Intelligence Services Oversight Committee. To his right, Mr. Guy Rapay, uh, Chair of the uh, Intelligence Services Oversight Committee, the so-called Comité R uh, in Belgium as well. And then to the left of um, Claude Moraes is Mr. Karsten uh, Lauritsen. I hope I get that right. And we met you this morning in a different uh, context, so very welcome again. Member of the Legal Affairs Committee and spokesperson for legal affairs of the Danish Volketing. Um, so we welcome the three panelists. I'm going to, uh, we're going to do the same routine, ask you to do a short presentation of maximum 10 minutes. Um, in the order that I've introduced you, and then we'll go. For both of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave it to you to divide up the time, and then we'll go to question and answer. Mr. Decker, the Decker, you have the floor. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je... Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to thank you, first of all, for this invitation, which um, simply means that we can pursue the relationship which already exists between you and the Senate Committee. I remember um, to the Parliament a few years ago to speak about the Echelon Report, which was the um, previous incarnation of the matter we are discussing today. Let me start, uh, first of all, by giving you a quick presentation on the Belgian control or oversight system, because I think the whole of this uh, subject is very much related to the ability to exercise oversight over what the intelligence agencies do. So let me give you a quick overview. The legal framework, first of all, it's, it dates back to a law on the 18th of July, 91, so 20, 
two years ago. This was the Belgian law which dealt with the organization of the security and intelligence services in the Belgian police. The Belgian parliament gave itself rights to exercise oversight over the intelligence agencies and the police services. In the context of what we are discussing today, I'm obviously not going to talk about oversight of the police services, but only about the intelligence services. In order to carry out effective oversight of intelligence services to ensure that uh, their state security is guaranteed, that's the civil intelligence service, and then there is also the military side of it, the law established a standing committee of intelligence oversight uh, Intelligence Services Oversight Committee, the famous OR Committee. This oversight is exercised in the parliamentary system by the Senate only, and probably in the future as things evolve, the Chamber of Representatives will take over this function. And there is a specific committee within the Senate which is responsible for monitoring the or committee, the oversight committee, and it is this Senate committee. It's made up of five senators. It is chaired by the uh, president of the Senate officially. And we have uh, the or committee and the monitoring committee, and the monitoring committee can ask the or committee to carry out investigative um, oversight tasks to uh, have communicated to it the investigative uh, studies so that it can prepare general conclusions and, if necessary, make recommendations. The R committee is made up of three members. The general advocate, Mr. on my right here, is the president. Mr. Abkai is a member head of the committee. The three members are designated or appointed by the Senate and through oversight bodies, it establishes whether uh, actions by intelligence services have violated in any way the rights and freedoms of individuals, or whether there is any indication of a lack of coordination or efficiency. So on the one hand, we looked at the respect of uh, freedoms and also at whether these services are effective. If necessary, it can issue a non-binding opinion on need for any action which is taken, which needs to be taken to remedy the situation, and these recommendations may also be um, turned into legislative proposals. As a body, the OR committee doesn't have any hierarchical link at all with the intelligence services it exercises oversight over. Its conclusions are made available to the monitoring committee, the ministers competent in the area, the Justice Minister, the Defence Minister, and of course the Prime Minister if necessary, and the other competent authorities if necessary depending on the subject in question, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in certain cases. It, they can then draw appropriate conclusions and take appropriate measures. The Parliament can use the results of the oversight body's work to take legislative initiatives, as I said, and to exercise its constitutional role of uh, controlling the executive power. In the PRISM case, the Monitoring Committee invited the OR Committee to initiate three investigations, and Mr. Rapai is going to tell you about those. In the view of the Parliamentary Committee, of course, mass interception of communications by the services of a country or countries which consider themselves to be friendly or adult countries uh, on the pretext of the fight against terrorism. It would seem to us that these measures do nonetheless seriously violate the fundamental freedoms that they are claiming to protect. Uh, in the fight against terrorism, of course, we uh, don't want the states to be naive. And if specific investigative and surveillance methods are justified as a result of that, Nonetheless, mass interception of communication and of data carried out in an indiscriminate way is not justified. 
Given the threat to our IT systems presented by the U.S. system at the moment, that is um, the suspicion, although obviously I can't affirm anything at the moment because investigations are underway at the moment. I heard uh, what um, the official responsible for this had to say earlier. A lot of the investigations are going to be extremely important. But this mass interception of uh, data, which has probably been carried out with the help of an EU member state, and that is also a fundamental question to my mind. Uh, to my mind, a common response in the European Union is necessary, regardless of what can be done by each member state individually. In the same way, I am of the opinion that an analysis of this situation between the NATO allied countries, because NATO is, after all, the main security and defense body we have in Europe. I think, therefore, that NATO also needs to look at this matter and to settle the question of relations between allied countries, because it is quite surprising that uh, allies are carrying out monitoring of each other. What um, strikes me as being dangerous, and uh, this is perhaps something which is already underway, is the fact that some member states of the European Union are negotiating individual agreements with the U.S. And that is why I am calling for a discussion on this within the EU and within NATO. And the major problem, of course, in all of this, which um, puts the European governments in an awkward position, is a result of the same process that we were looking at 10 years ago when we looked into the Echelon case. The fact that several members of the EU are carrying out similar activities. And recently, I heard on French television a debate where Mr. Attali was present. Mr. Attali was speaking in a personal capacity, of course, but he said that based on his experience, he was um, Secretary General at the Elysee for many years, and he said, uh, I can tell you that France is doing the same thing, and if France had had an opportunity to do more, it would have done more. So that is the reality that uh, we are faced with in terms of uh, interception and monitoring. I mean, I, I took the case of France, but all the big European countries are doing the same at perhaps different levels, uh, perhaps different echelons, if you like. Uh, this is the reality. So we are constantly coming up against this problem of the fundamental principles which have to be subject to the oversight of parliamentary committees as they are there and subject to parliamentary scrutiny in the member states. Most of the EU member states do not have a parliamentary oversight of their intelligence services, and that is a factor which I feel is very significant. Between the member states and between the NATO countries, there should be uh, rules for good conduct established. And that should be the rule. We don't want to be naive. But it is also important that um, we do not see the emergence of uh, bilateral agreements. I think that would be harmful to Europe. And the f what we have seen here, as was said in the previous panel, should, I think, encourage us to develop more IT capacity in Europe. As has already been said, most of the IT systems that we use are not European systems, and this has consequences in terms of the risks, as we very well know. And we knew that when we bought them. We could also have developed more European systems. We have over 500 million citizens. It should be possible for us to do this. So those are the comments I would like to make to you, and I'll pass the f give the floor now to Mr. Rapay. Madame la Présidente, je m'associe évidemment. Madam Chair, clearly I also um, would like to thank you, uh, as Mr. Dedeka has, because uh, it's important for national oversight bodies to be able to work with the European institutions and Parliament.
Belgium has two intelligence services. It has a military one, uh, state security, which comes under the justice ministry, and that one is active solely within Belgian territory. The other intelligence service is a military one uh, under the defense ministry, and that can act in Belgium, but also abroad. It's important to know, since it's not the same in all countries, that our intelligence services have no police or judicial competence. Scrutiny of the intelligence services is conducted in particular by the legislature and the special Senate Oversight Committee and the Standing Intelligence Agencies Committee as described by Mr. De Decker. There are three members in the committee appointed by the Senate and this collegiate structure is important because it guarantees the independence of the committee in respect of the executive, which is to say ministries, uh, ministers, but also it's independent of the services. We undertake a number of tasks, but I think three are of particular interest to your committee. Firstly, we conduct what we in jargon call uh, scrutiny inquiries at our own initiative at the request of the ministers competent or the parliament in particular, in particular the review committee and we can open an inquiry after a complaint uh, made by a private individual or a denunciation. The committee was established uh, 20 years ago and over 200 inquiries have been completed. Some of them have been mentioned here such as SWIFT, the CIA flights, echelon but also there was an inquiry into the bugging of the Justice Lipsius, build, Lipsius building. Our committee's scrutiny relates to the legality but also the efficiency and coordination in the operations of the services which sets us apart from a number of our colleagues particularly in the Netherlands because alongside the legality we're also looking at the efficiency or effectiveness. The aim of the scrutiny is to have ongoing democratic scrutiny of uh, the safeguard of rights and uh, freedoms, but also we need to ensure that the services mentioned are working properly. Secondly, the scrutiny body since 2003 has been allowed to look into possible intercepts of foreign communications by the military intelligence services which are entitled to do that uh, on a limited basis to protect Belgian troops abroad or to protect Belgian nationals living abroad. For two years now this service has also been legally entitled to uh, look into frequencies of communications of interest to it and it can do that uh, and the uh, scrutiny committee has been looking into an inquiry on that for two years now. In terms of uh, the missions of the committee as part of the uh, law on the methods of the intelligence services, we've uh, had some fairly far-reaching inquiries uh, um, looking into uh, the tools available such as interception of communications or the gathering of banking data and the committee has also a, a final uh, power of decision uh, without uh, appeal. The approach is a case-by-case -case examination of proportionality and uh, subsidiarity and legality. The services uh, in Belgium have been given certain powers under the 2010 law but these relate only to operations conducted on Belgian territory and the targets have to be specific and the threats have to be specific. So there's no question here of having wide-ranging or strategic intercepts as in other countries. The committee has been tasked with three inquiries by the Senate. A fourth one has just come in. I'll try and flesh out uh, the background to the three inquiries and I'll say something briefly about the fourth one. So the first uh, inquiry is as follows. 
It's the scrutiny inquiry into the information position of the Belgian intelligence services on the mass harvesting and mining of metadata by certain states and the way in which these states have engaged in political espionage against so-called friendly states. In this inquiry, the intention of the committee is to establish exactly what was known or not known by the Belgian services and what they should have known and whether they actively were involved in supporting these states or not and whether they informed the authorities in good time of any intelligence gained. It goes without saying that this inquiry is underway. Final uh, hearings w uh, will be taking place next week. I can't give you much more information today. The law requires us first to present our findings before the committee. The second uh, inquiry is more to do with uh, the legal aspects and privacy of data and the exchange of data internationally between intelligence services. For a number of years now, the committee has stressed the need to set up special rules for the exchange of data between the intelligence services of different countries, and I would add democratic countries. The third inquiry conducted by the committee is about uh, the scientific and economic potential of Belgium which may have been disrupted by electronic uh, surveillance and I don't think I need to enter into that anymore. The fourth inquiry was one which arises from a request made from the Flemish speaking Brussels Bar Association. In these inquiries we have significant powers. The committee is entitled to uh, call in all uh, texts it requires to accomplish its task. We also are entitled to hear from all persons we uh, believe need to be heard from and they can't invoke uh, professional confidentiality. We can also uh, seize objects and documents and conduct any consultations we believe necessary under the inquiry. We also have our own archives and we can also appoint as we've done before, specialists working under oath or experts. Now, as I've said, the services have also already answered an initial round of questions. A second round of questions was recently sent out to them, and final hearings, I believe, and briefings should be conducted next week. So then, like your committee, we're in a fact-finding phase at the moment. We're not in a position to give you any further information now. Uh, the special point is that, like you, we are facing new re revelations day by day, which I would say means uh, that uh, no one can say what will happen tomorrow. Let me, by way of a conclusion, make a couple of suggestions where we as a committee believe that the European Parliament could play a pioneering role. Firstly, when it comes to cooperation between the oversight bodies at a European level. In 2010, in October, the sixth conference of the parliamentary scrutiny bodies of the intelligence services of the member states of the European Union was held, and it also included Switzerland and Norway, and it concluded with the so-called Declaration of Brussels. And the parliamentarians present then said, I quote, we recognise the need and utility of a more intensive exchange of information between the parliamentary scrutiny bodies. The Belgian Parliament undertook an initiative by setting up an internet, the European Network of National Intelligence Reviewers, ANNIR, but so far the results are disappointing. We've had some case-by-case uh, -case involvement from the Netherlands, Germany and Norway, but not much other use of this website. I think we need to look at budgets, perhaps at a European level, for general cooperation between the scrutiny bodies. That was a recommendation formulated by uh, Lee and Cameron last week, and of course, if the European Parliament uh, wants to support the ENIA site, we would be extremely happy about that. A second point, you'll be well familiar with the rule about uh, disclosure to uh, third party services. Now it's a very important role, 
but I don't think that is a rule that should exclude any scrutiny bodies. Uh, Cameron and Lee uh, last week said, I quote, overseers are not to be seen as third parties. The Belgian scrutiny body has the same interpretation of that rule, of course, uh, with the necessary caveats, because we don't want to endanger the proper operations of the Belgian intelligence services. But I'd also like to draw to your attention that this difficulty was discussed at the seventh conference of the parliamentary scrutiny bodies in Berlin 2011. And since then, we're still waiting for any initiatives to be undertaken. I'd like to conclude uh, my statement there, and of course I'm open to any questions you may care to ask. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Then I'm going to invite uh, our last panelist, Mr. Lauritsen, from the Danish Parliament. <coughs> yeah, tak. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to come and give a short briefing on the... Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you, and I'd just like to tell you a little bit about uh, our uh, oversight in the Danish Parliament of our uh, intelligence services. And perhaps I can uh, bring you up to date on the uh, latest events um, following the Snowden affair. First of all, I can tell you about uh, our oversight bodies. And then I'd uh, like to tell you about the initiatives taken by the Danish government and um, by the focusing the Danish uh, parliament on these rather more recent cases. Many of you may believe that Dan Denmark is a very progressive country, but I think where we're not so progressive is uh, in the area of parliamentary oversight of our intelligence and investigation services. We hardly uh, check on them at all. Last year, a parliamentary uh, bill was submitted, and it was actually passed as a law, uh, to uh, create a new oversight body uh, to check on the intelligence services. But that uh, new oversight body has very limited powers. We uh, can't, for example, carry out a physical inspection of intelligence services premises. It's just not allowed by the law. Uh, we can't check on the uh, individuals, uh, publish information about people working in the intelligence services. However, we can deal with uh, um, complaints which may be made by uh, citizens in the way in which legislation is applied. But the fact is we're not um, very autonomous. What we do have is a uh, parliamentary committee um, monitoring the activities of the intelligence services. Uh, this is called the Parliamentary uh, Monitoring Committee or Parliamentary Control Committee. But it's not really an oversight committee as such. It is a group of um, MPs who can get in touch with the intelligence services in order to clarify certain uh, aspects. Uh, that's been uh, a committee, a parliamentary committee, which has been in existence for some time. Uh, it is possible for that uh, committee to have uh, sight of certain documents, have access to documents. However, it is the government that takes a decision as to uh, which documents will be submitted to the group. They will have the statistics, they may get uh, budgetary data submitted to the committee, and the committee may assess whether there's proportionality between all of that and uh, what the intelligence services are actually doing in practice. But it's not really proper oversight. It, now, if we find out that a law has been infringed, all this committee can do is to inform the Ministry of Justice or the Public Prosecutor's Office. So it's not really a proper oversight, a parliamentary oversight committee with strong powers. But that's what we have in Denmark. That's what we have to um, deal with. So what about more recent events? Well, we're beginning to uh, um, deal with the whole issue of uh, data protection in, in Denmark. Uh, now people have a great deal of faith in uh, Danish institutions and in the intelligence services. Uh, we, the Danes in general have very great confidence in public bodies, and I think that's um, to, to a great extent been justified. And they have actually trusted the intelligence services hitherto. 
more recently, people have been more concerned about the protection of personal data. And this is not just in the light of the Snowden revelations, but though, you know, the recent allegations that um, Chancellor Merkel's um, phone had been tapped, her mobile phone had been listened in on. But, for example, there was um, a, a Swedish um, uh, internet uh, piracy case and also a Dane, a Dane who was hacking into, uh, and Swede who was hacking into all sorts of um, um, data without anybody uh, spotting it. These hackers had had access to information uh, about the uh, email uh, accounts, for example, of a whole series of police commissioners, all sorts of information that they got from those emails. Uh, information uh, going from high-level police uh, commissioners to other high-level uh, police officers. In the end, those hackers were caught, and it wasn't any foreign power, even though they were basically professional c computer hackers. Uh, they could have done a lot of damage, but it wasn't actually uh, a, a, another country, another power. I mean, these are very sort of these people sitting at home with their laptop packing, basically. But th that sort of thing made people a bit worried, and uh, that meant that uh, the whole issue of personal um, data privacy um, became uh, front page news. But hitherto, the government has never actually uh, set up any um, investigative committee to deal with these kind of issues. Uh, in statements to our Danish Parliament, our Minister of Justice has uh, said that as far as they know, as far as the Minister knows, no um, Danish public institution uh, or personality has been uh, in any way uh, uh, bugged. But um, no, they, they certainly don't know uh, of this happening. We've had another uh, authority speak to us, the Data Protection Authority, and the Data Protection Authority is still waiting to see the results of the European Union's investigation into all this uh, um, intelligence activity. And I know that uh, the commissioners ha ha has asked uh, our ministers to, to get in touch with other uh, ministers, other opposite numbers, for example, the NSA, uh, to try and clarify this issue. But I know that our minister has refused to uh, do this directly. We need to look at the way in which uh, um, oversight committees work in our parliaments. Uh, our oversight committee certainly wishes to investigate all these events. But obviously, uh, this is always subject to uh, confidentiality. Uh, I can't uh, report uh, to you as to what the uh, oversight body in Denmark is doing, because we have to um, swear confidentiality. Clearly, the Danish government is uh, coming under a lot of pressure. People are pressing them to um, give more information or to go into a little bit deeper as to their cooperation with other countries. Um, and how secure is it to uh, use the Internet in Denmark? There has been criticism of our Prime Minister um, herself and the Minister of Justice because they're quite simply saying, oh, there's no problem, all the rules are being applied, uh, and we feel that it's a bit doubtful whether that's true or not. But because of the system that we have, we don't have any further powers, and that's the, the way things stand at the moment in the Danish system, we don't have the true oversight body that has the right, has sufficient powers. I'm afraid that's the way it is, that we have very little control over what our intelligence uh, services are doing. Uh, and you can't really say that it's being properly uh, supervised, because it's not. In the face of all these recent revelations, There have been questions asked as to uh, whether the appropriate measures have been uh, applied. Um, some of the uh, standards applied in the European Union, 
for example, we um, often opt out of uh, cooperation uh, in uh, justice and home affairs uh, issues in the EU. So we'll have to see how things um, pan out. Um, there were about um, 810 million um, items of information which may have been examined. And uh, we have to look at proportionality here. There's all sorts of information being gathered in um, by police services, by um, by the uh, authorities, 810,000 million, 810, million uh, units of information, uh, I correct. And uh, the, one wonders whether this is proportional to the very small percentage which actually would have involved criminal activity. If you're looking at interception and, and bugging, uh, whether this is all actually proportional to the uh, activities they actually uncover. Now, in the um, Legal Affairs Committee of the Danish uh, Parliament, we are preparing a report on the activities of the intelligence services. I personally am very worried about um, security issues, as is the case um, in the European Union institutions, but I wonder what we can do in national parliaments. Obviously, the best thing would it be for us to have uh, effective legislation at European level in the first place, and that's why the activities of the Libe Committee in this area are so significant. Uh, perhaps this uh, could result in um, uh, a better um, directive on, um, on personal data protection, uh, something which we could really apply in Denmark as well, protecting people when they're operating on the Internet and protecting their personal data in, partic in particular. That's it, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Mr. Lauritsen, now that brings us to the uh, questions and answers session. Uh, some of our colleagues have had to leave, and I apologize on their behalf, but this is uh, the end of our parliamentary weekend if they want to uh, make it back home, they have to catch their flights. <laughs> so um, I'm going to first ask the, the rapporteur, <coughs> Claude Moraes, to come in. Yeah, I also apologize for that, and it's no <coughs> reflection on the excellent um, contribution you've just made, which has been very thorough uh, from all of you. Um, what we're trying to do in these sessions, which uh, Sophia, our chair, mentioned, was the, the latest in snapshots of uh, oversight arrangements of various parliaments has been to try and get a, a, a sense of what the oversight arrangements have been of e individual EU member states. And if I could first of all ask um, the colleagues, uh, parliamentary colleagues from um, the Belgian Senate, um, the first question really was to get a, some clarity on where, whether the Belgian Oversight Committee can oversee international transfers. Is that, is that really what you were saying, or are you limited on this? I mean, it, you gave me the impression, I mean, both of you gave me the impression that the existing powers that you have are quite thorough. You get individual um, complaints, which is better than what we've heard from some uh, models of oversight, uh, which gives some openness. Um, on the face of it, what you've described is um, a very thorough system of taking those individual complaints I mean, there seems to be some transparency in the way that you investigate uh, those complaints. But my question is, are you hampered by the third party rule? Um, when the PRISM um, NSA allegations happened, did you feel that your oversight arrangements um, alongside the allegations coming from the issues of EU institutions and SWIFT, given that you are Belgians and you have the institutions within your borders, did you feel that your oversight arrangements because I realize you have your inquiry on now, but notwithstanding that, did you feel you were overwhelmed by these allegations that your existing oversight arrangements could deal with that? Or do you feel that you, you, needed, you, needed, that you needed reform? Because we are now hearing from different member states oversight arrangements, and we know that many probably do need reform. So as parliamentarians, obviously have some experience, you've, you've been on these committees. Um, tell us what, what you feel um, do, you, do you have the adequate oversight arrangements or not? And are you hampered by the, the third party rule? Maybe I'll just leave it at that. Um, and then for the Danish, we'll ask yep. the uh, colleague, uh, the, the Danish. We, um, we also had evidence from um, our um, Swedish parliamentarians in charge of the uh, oversight committee for the FRA in Sweden. And there were obviously allegations of um, 
spying on other Nordic countries, including mm -hmm. Denmark. I'm not sure if you actually specifically mentioned this, but you did mention that, of course, there were not many allegations um, live in Denmark and so on, but this was one of them. So clearly you had talked about oversight arrangements not being dealt with adequately in your opinion. Um, now, if this is the case, surely this is one of those um, which would have at least excited some public disquiet. If that's the case, is this stimulating some uh, public debate as to improving oversight arrangements in Denmark? If so, what model are you following? Are you following a particular European model? Are you looking to another EU member state? Are you looking at a Nordic model? In our inquiry, we, we really want to at least focus on uh, a better model of oversight, um, given the sort of overwhelming number of allegations that are now happening. So it would be good to give, give your uh, view on that, given that you're now in this, uh, this um, point in your um, oversight arrangements, you're building a new one. Thank you, Claude. I'm going to ask our panellists to, uh, to reply in the same order as they took the floor. So, Mr. Mr. De Decker first. Je serai, je serai très brief. Well, I can be very brief. Mr. Rapai will have something to add, I'm sure. As regards the resources available to us to um, deal with this significant international phenomenon, well, all I can say is that uh, when the Echelon uh, affair broke ten years ago. There were only two parliamentary committees who did uh, inquiries into it, and it was the Belgian Senate and the European Parliament. We were the only two parliaments to have an investigation into this. And uh, when we have an inquiry carried out by the OR Committee, obviously the OR Committee does the work necessary vis-à-vis -vis the intelligence services. Uh, Certain information is received by the OR committee anyway, and it has to then select which information it can communicate and which information it cannot. Because uh, in intelligence information, protecting the source is extremely important, of course. But uh, in the work that uh, we are doing, I think that uh, it will definitely be a great support to the Belgian government in dealing with this subject in international fora, because when you don't have uh, adequate information, you can't speak out. You're afraid of looking ridiculous by saying things that are incorrect. As regards the other technical and legal resources available, perhaps Mr. Um, Rappai can comment on that. Compétences du comité, je pense que. Yes, perhaps I can explain how our committee works. I do think that we do have um, a good array of legislation available to us. But I think we have to be aware that the whole idea of the committee is to have oversight of the Belgian intelligence services and only the Belgian intelligence services. We do not have powers or competences to uh, monitor the foreign intelligence services who are present in Belgium and are active in Belgium. Last year, at the request of the former president of the uh, Senate, we did carry out an uh, investigation as to how Belgian intelligence services were keeping an eye on foreign intelligence services active in Belgium, where they had what we term a, an, a significant diaspora in Belgium. So uh, it was a matter of seeing how um, the Belgian intelligence service worked in um, uh, their surveillance of um, foreign intelligence services. However, it's rather difficult because most of these foreign intelligence services are supposed to be friends, in inverted commas, at least those that have significant uh, uh, influence or diaspora within uh, Belgian territory. So it's a bit of a difficult um, situation. But um, at the request of our Senate, we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, perhaps asked to keep an eye on friendly intelligence services in Belgium, but it's very difficult. And the fact is there are an awful lot of so-called enemy um, foreign intelligence services present uh, in Belgium as well, particularly in Brussels. So there's, there's quite a lot on our plates. So it's a matter of priority, really. It's very difficult to cope with all of it. Now, one thing which we haven't got in our law, um, and I think is um, 
something which has only recently been uh, considered, we've suggested that uh, in our law, and we talk about the intelligence services, that it is stated explicitly that these services should uh, be monitoring the activity of uh, foreign intelligence services, because that would help our intelligence services to be more active in that area. Now, as to um, our committee, um, there are only three of us. It's a collegiate body. Uh, of course, there's not just the three of us in one sense because we have a, an investigation service, we have a, a legal service and um, some document administrative, uh, administration staff. Um, so we have about I don't know, 20, 25 people um, to check on, um, on what's being done by the Belgian intelligence services who are already very busy, um, especially in Brussels. Now, technically speaking, we also need the right IT we need um, really good IT people. There's an awful lot of competition from the private sector, and it requires a lot of investment. Belgium, like other countries, and of course the EU itself, is uh, subject to uh, difficult budgetary constraints. And this is not going to improve, I think, in the next few years. And the financial aspect is a very significant uh, limitation. We really do need uh, much more investment uh, in IT security and uh, ways in which we can protect our um, uh, IT and communication structures in infrastructure in Belgium. One government decision was taken after a recommendation made in uh, 2011. The government um, did... Um, say back in 2011, especially after the Snowden revelations recently, um, they did say that they intended to invest a lot into protecting uh, the government's own communications uh, circuits. And that's, I suppose, a first step. Now, I um, may be a little critical, but the fact is that the R committee, the Intelligence com the, the uh, Oversight Committee, had asked the Belgian government to do this for years, uh, and it took really the Snowden affair to get uh, money flowing in order to protect the um, political communication system of the government. Thank you for the questions. Regarding the Danish system, I, as, I, uh, as I said in my presentation, we actually made a new law uh, last year. Uh, before making that law uh, on parliamentary oversight and this new uh, independent um, oversight of, of the intelligence service, we, the Justice Committee made a study trip to Norway and to the UK. Um, and, and then there was a committee work that has been going on for 10 years and their recommendation, it all came together to this law that was passed last year um, and um, and the, the, I think if if we had this discussion right now about making a new law the outcome would be different uh, due to the Snowden uh, um, uh, uh, discussion uh, but uh, but it was passed last year and, and there's there's no political pressure for changing that law uh, so I've even though there's some discussion and some, there's some parliamentary debate, there's no, I don't think that the law will be changed in a way where there's giving more parliamentary control uh, or more uh, legal control with the intelligence service. Uh, I don't think that's likely to, uh, to happen. Regarding uh, Sweden, there has been some Danish uh, discussion on, on Sweden. The interesting thing about the Swedish case is that Sweden are monitoring everything that goes into the Swedish system and everything that comes out, which means that if I have uh, my, if Facebook has placed my, uh, the server where my things are in Sweden, uh, that the Swedish uh, intelligence service can monitor whatever comes in and goes, goes out of the system. But, but it, there's really, to understand where Denmark stands in this and, and why there's not that much political pressure on, on the government and, there isn't, there's a parliamentary debate, but it's not on a, on that higher level, is, is the fact that there's no smoking gun in, in a Danish uh, case. And there's a, a wide range of confidence to, to the intelligence service, and I think there's, uh, there's basis also for having a lot of confidence to, to the intelligence service. Um, but there's no, no smoking gun in Denmark, that's what the debate also, uh, 
uh, reflects. Uh, and uh, I can give you a little example on, on I think if the quote I'm going to make, if, if that came from somebody in the European Parliament or in another European country, there would be a media debate about it, but there was none in, in Denmark. There was a Danish member of Parliament saying, regarding the NSA surveillance, saying that uh, uh, he understood completely why the Americans were paying attention to Europe, because we make a lot of problems for ourselves. So if he was an American, he would also uh, just eavesdrop on, on politicians. And that's, he wasn't, it wasn't a joke, it was actually, it was actually a quote. Uh, and that didn't really create any fuss of any kind. Uh, uh, so this, the Danish uh, public opinion is, is I think, uh, and the lack of a privacy debate in Denmark is, uh, is a little bit frightening, to be honest. Uh, that's my personal point of view, but, but that is the case in, in Denmark. And there's, there's no smoking gun or anything that's going to change that in, in the near future. But there's, as I said, an up coming focus on this whole data protection area. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Then I'll uh, switch caps again. So now I'm speaking as the uh, ALDE shadow. Um, my first questions are to our Danish friend. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit the, the devil's advocate here because sure. it's still an inquiry and we both belong to the same political family. Um, and your party's also been in, in government in some previous governments, which you know, gave you the opportunity of introducing new laws. And I was just wondering um, if, I mean, Denmark, like the Netherlands, my country uh, is often mentioned as one of the four uh, main allies of the United States. The, uh, the Secretary General of NATO is um, a fellow, fellow countryman of yours uh, and, and a party friend as well, incidentally. And I was just wondering um, if, if uh, you have ever noticed any U.S. pressure uh, preventing Denmark from introducing better uh, oversight mechanisms, uh, or if it's not pressure, then at least, let's say, friendly requests. Incidentally, ha having witnessed everything that happened over the last couple of months, maybe we should redefine the term friend. Um, then some questions to um, our Belgian uh, colleagues here. Um, you've, you've raised the question yourself. Um, how much did the Secret Services know? How much did the government know? Uh, to what extent are Secret Services acting on their own? Because more and more you get the impression that, or let me put it this way, I don't get an impression. I, I have more and more question marks about, uh, you know, if secret services are still in control of governments. Um, yeah, you know, you wonder about Germany as well. If, it, what happens if the, 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 the mobile phone of the Bundeskanzlerin is, is, uh, is wiretapped? How does that work? Didn't the secret services know about that, in which case they're totally incompetent? Did they know about it and they didn't tell her? Or did they know about it and they told her and she was just, um, you know, pretending in public? I mean, there aren't any other scenarios. So how is it in Belgium? Uh, if all the secret services in, in Europe seem to be in bed together with the American secret services and who, know who, else, who knows who else, um, did the Belgian secret services know about it and they didn't tell you? Or were they able to hide it from you? Um, or is it the other way around? Have they been acting on orders of successive governments of a different political makeup? Um, how come, I mean, are the Belgian secret services completely out of the loop? Um, but if they're not, if they're, they're part of this, this cross-border cooperation, how come the oversight mechanisms, which strike me as, as, as pretty strong, it's pretty uh, efficient. How come the oversight mechanisms have not exposed any, uh, any, any violations? Uh, then about cross-border cooperation, because that is, of course, the biggest, the biggest black hole. Uh, there may be national oversight mechanisms, and they may be very strong oversight mechanisms. Some countries have weak oversight mechanisms. But no matter uh, you know, how strong some, like the Belgian oversight mechanisms are, a chain is as strong as the weakest link. So if the, the joint oversight bodies, at, at least within the European Union, um, 
you know, how do they manage to oversee the cooperation between their secret services? Um, and not only bilateral cooperation, but also within the context of INSEN, you know, this, this kind of shady EU body which officially doesn't exist, only with a dotted line. Um, uh, what other questions did I want to ask? Um, yeah. Oh, yes, I have one final, one final question. Um, I was struck, we had the, the, the Belgian... Um, the Belgian uh, Data Protection Authority, the uh, Commission pour la Protection de la Vie Privée, mm -hmm. here with us uh, during uh, the session on Belgacom. And I, I was just struck, and, and I, I, you know, the Belgian Data Protection Authority tends to be very, um, you know, they're almost militant, really very much on top of things. So I was very struck to hear him say, oh, but everything's fine. We've, we've not seen that any, any data uh, have been compromised or any personal data have been, been accessed. I mean, that seems so implausible. Um, would you say that there is any kind of, uh, are, are they bound to silence somehow, uh, even if they've, they've observed that data have been compromised? And if so, would something like that be brought to your attention? Um, shall I, I ask you to, to answer in the order that I've put the question? So first Denmark and then Belgium. Uh, well, uh, thank you for, for the question and, and uh, for, for acting uh, as the devil's advocate. Uh, I really enjoyed that with the last session we had, uh, which, by the way, the introductions was very producial and, uh, well, not very, not that interesting. But the debate was very good uh, due to some very interesting questions. Um, that was very useful for me. But to answer your question about um, whether the, the U.S. has put any pressure on Denmark, I don't believe so. And I, we've, I, we consider the U.S. a strong ally of, uh, of Denmark, and we have a strong cooperation. And I don't believe, I firmly don't believe that, that they have any interest in uh, or are pressuring the Danish uh, authorities in any way regarding our oversight uh, facilities or not uh, enhancing our oversight facilities. The, uh, they have, a, well, actually a, a, an interesting system in, in the U.S. Congress for, for oversight on, on the intelligence service. So, um, so I don't see why they should oppose uh, some of the countries working together with them uh, to, to have the same system. So, so I don't believe that uh, that, uh, that has, has happened. Uh, the reason why we have the level of oversight uh, as, as we're having in, in, in Denmark is, I think uh, it, it's due to the fact that, uh, that uh, that's the political compromise, but it's also due to the fact that there's no, there's no evidence or, or anything that that's, says that this Danish intelligence service, secret service, uh, I, I doing things they're not supposed to do. Uh, so there's no, there hasn't really been any discussion on this in, in the Danish uh, uh, public opinion, uh, and, and there's no pressure on politicians. So even from a theoretical point of view, you could make the argument that there's no ballot, there's not balance in the system. That's my personal view, uh, but but uh, that's not being. There's no pressure for changing the the laws uh, and the the tools of the oversight committees uh, in the parliament or the independent uh, oversight uh, committee that was passed uh, last year with this new uh, uh, law proposal uh, because there's, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no evidence saying that, that, the, uh, that the Danish intelligence service are uh, working outside of, of the Danish uh, law. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think that um, uh, that there's going to be a pressure on changing that until it shows, and I really hope that it doesn't show that, that something is, is not working within the boundaries of the law. Thank you. Okay, so nothing rotten in the kingdom of Denmark. <laughs> 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 Mr. De Decker. Well, as regards PRISM and our services and uh, our governments, I don't think either that there has been 
complicity on the part of our services or that our services uh, were informed or failed to inform the political authorities. When you see the anger of uh, the German Chancellor and given the importance of the relationship between Germany and the United States and Germany's position in NATO, it's impossible even to imagine for a second that the German intelligence services wouldn't have informed the Chancellor had they known something and I think the same applies to us. However, there's another phenomenon. The NSA is a military intelligence service and military intelligence services in NATO know each other and they exchange information. And on that basis to imagine complicity or that they were in the loop, I cannot imagine even for a second but the inquiry is beginning in our country and we'll see whether the Belgian services were informed or not. I don't think so personally. I think it's something which links into the naivety of the European countries. We are a well-respected continent in the world because we're peaceful. We're a peaceful power but I think we tend too much to look with frankness and naivety to the rest of the world and we can't understand that uh, national governments act in light of their national interests and that's why I'm persuaded that one day we'll find out just how many European countries are engaged in surveillance of other European countries and probably not on a small scale but on a large scale and I think that's what we're going to have to face up to and that's where parliamentary scrutiny in national parliaments is important on this topic because that's how, and particularly the European Parliament by the way, that's how we can hope to move on. But this naivety, this frankness is part of it and also the development in technologies which is moving much more quickly than politicians can imagine is an issue and the big uh, services tend to use technology as much as they can without necessarily informing the government about it. I'm not certain, far from certain, that Mr. Obama has had a full explanation of what the NSA was doing. That hasn't been written anywhere. It's possible he knew, it's possible he didn't know. That also prompts uh, the question of uh, the US uh, Congress's uh, scrutiny of what the US services are doing. They've had that uh, congressional scrutiny for a long time, but it's been very closed and monitored. And in the scrutiny committee of the US Parliament, uh, if you're a member of that committee, uh, then you're highly respected. So I think all this needs uh, to be developed in the United States. Perhaps that will be the consequences of this because I don't think uh, overall the US authorities are particularly proud of what has been discovered thanks to Snowden moreover because it's thanks to Snowden we know I think it needs to be checked out but uh, thanks to Snowden we know more and I think that will have very major consequences within the alliance and within each of the countries of the alliance I hope so because I don't want to be too uh, naive in the future either. Well, I'd just like to add a little bit to what Mr. De Decker has already said. Our investigations are underway at the moment, so we will have a clearer picture next week and over the weeks to come. The question that was raised, well, not just one question, in fact, but several questions, what do the services know? What should they have known? And did they carry out what we call a risk analysis, given past experience, uh, given the Swift affair, the Echelon affair, did they uh, not at some point think or should they not have uh, envisaged the possibility of something else happening uh, with the current technology available? So that is a question that we are confronted with at the moment. We don't yet have specific replies to those questions. Apart from that, we have no indications that the Belgian intelligence services, with the means available to them, are monitoring the government. I think that we can rest assured on that. As regards cooperation between services, 
Now, to regard cooperation between services, well, that is, of course, something which is extremely sensitive. Mr. Decker talked about specific uh, forms of cooperation within NATO, and it's true that uh, we may get more information in that way from uh, the military intelligence service, which is closer contacts with NATO rather than from the civil intelligence service, which is more focused on the Belgian situation and is active only in Belgium. We don't yet have a reply on that. But I think if we really want to have a European response, I have to repeat what I said at the beginning of my presentation. We will need initiatives to be taken in the European Parliament and specifically uh, establishing standards vis-à-vis -vis the national parliament so that the national parliaments will have parliamentary oversight services which are really efficient rather than the bodies who don't get access to documents, who have to go via the government to get information. So I think all of those efforts need to be made in the uh, years to come by the European Parliament. Now, as regards the Commission on the Protection of uh, Private Life, I don't know exactly what they do. I don't know exactly what information they have. We have contacts with this committee, but they are mainly interested in protection of privacy and establishing whether personal data have uh, been um, intercepted by certain services but that aspect of thing is of things is something that we don't have a clear picture of at the moment judicial investigations are underway at the moment as i said and these investigations and inquiries will also look into any possible hacking for example in the belgacom case or in other similar cases there was a complaint from the ministry of foreign affairs and from the Prime Minister because their IT systems uh, had been hacked into in recent months. We don't know who is responsible for this. That may be the subject of a judicial investigation as well. brings us to uh, the last uh, questions of today. Jan Albrecht. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if I should play the good or the bad cop now after you and all these things, but I just talk to you as colleagues. And uh, I'm very happy that you are here. And I'm very happy that you're mentioning the Brussels Declaration and that you are calling for common action. I think that's what we need to start off from now, from this meeting at, uh, at the latest, and also from our report, which we hopefully will conclude uh, beginning of next year. Uh, but there I also have to say, um, looking at the situation in which we are, the treaty is there. And we have answers, written answers, by your governments and the governments of our member states saying clearly that they will not testify here with regard to the situation of the treaties, saying that national security is the exclusive competence of member states, and there's nothing to talk about, nothing to talk about, you know? And that I would really like to know, just one question. Do you know, uh, Mr. Lauritsen, what INSEN is? So uh, do, do you deal with the, the cooperation of, of intelligence services on the European level? And do you, do, do you deal with the questions of uh, uh, which rules apply to that? Because I have to say, I searched for a legal base for this cooperation, and there is no, there is no legal base. It's even an infringement to the treaty if we follow the interpretation of the member states. So, I mean, without your help, we will never get any further action. And there I also, sorry, I, I just used the time without questioning only, but I, I think that it's a very important moment because politically uh, said, uh, if, we, if we now sit here and talk about in the upcoming years, there need to be some actions. I mean, I can tell you, the people out there, they ask us, the parliamentarians, national parliamentarians and European parliamentarians, are the secret services, the intelligence services of European member states standing over the parliament, parliaments and the governments? Are they out of reach? I mean, it's no wonder that in our member states people are voting for populist parties telling them that all of this is crap. And um, there I, I really need to point out on Denmark. I mean, uh, we had in our first hearing here Duncan Kempfel, an investigative journalist, and he laid out 
with referring to the documents of Edward Snowden, so to proofs which are not contested until today, that Denmark has a cooperation program with the NSA called Dynamo, uh, which is looking at the submarine or uh, the, the, these uh, subsea cables somehow, you know, and not submarine, but subsea cables uh, to analyze information blanketly. I mean, this going on, I mean, that's an infringement. I don't know if it's to national law, but then perhaps national law in that extent is not in line with the ECHR, with the ECHR rulings with Article 10 of the Strasbourg Court rulings and the underlying uh, Convention on Human Rights, which is one of our fundamental principles of our European member states or nation states, you know. And, and also a fundamental principle in the European Union is loyal cooperation. And you mentioned that also. I, I'm very happy about your uh, uh, mentioning, uh, Mr. De Decker. I'm, I'm, I think that the principle of, law, of loyal cooperation completely goes against the bilateral agreements, which you mentioned too. And uh, there, I, I really uh, don't see that attacks by British authorities or alleged attacks by British authorities to the territory of other member states, like your Facebook server in Sweden being attacked by the GCHQ. It's not only the Swedish intelligence services looking in your Facebook data. It's the GCHQ by attacking companies. You know, I, I mean, we need to get active on that. And uh, I really would like to know, what are we doing? I mean, what are the next steps? Are we calling to not do anything more if not the Brussels Declaration is implemented by our governments? That's, that's really a, a, an important question. What is the next step with regard to the Brussels Declaration? Are we just putting it forward, saying our people, we are doing something, but we are actually not? Uh, and, and also, uh, I think we need a clarification. Uh, with regard to what is foreign security, as you were saying, uh, the, the, uh, the spying on, on foreign activities. I mean, the BND in Germany, just recently it was clear that they interpret the Internet as being foreign. Completely. Completely. I mean, uh, and if the BND in Germany is doing that, I mean, they are afraid of really being in public outcry at the moment, and, I mean, you, you should also, I think, start investigations in your member states. And I would like to know if something is happening like that. Thank you. Thank you. I keep, I keep thinking that you know, a lot of people are saying, well, we shouldn't give any more powers to Brussels and it's becoming a super state. <laughs> yes. The super state is somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, same order. Mr. Lauritsen, Mr. De Decker, Mr. Appé. Um. Well, um, there, there was one of the former speakers on the last session saying no comments a number of times, and he can't elaborate. And I have to say on a, on a, a couple of your questions when it comes to uh, the question of Dynamo, U.S., Danish uh, cooperation, I, I, can't, uh, I can't give you any answer on that. And even if I knew anything, I, I couldn't tell you anything. I wouldn't be allowed to tell you anything. So... Um, and when it comes to your questions about incident, uh, I can say that's not a debate in the Danish, uh, in the Danish parliament. Um, it, perhaps it, it should be, um, and I'll be happy to, uh, to look into uh, to, uh, the two things that you're, you're touching upon. But I can tell you that it's, it's not been a discussion uh, so far. Um, and, um, well, the Danish parliament is also divided in the question whether and that's perhaps to elaborate on some of my points before, whether you should increase uh, parliamentary oversight. There's a number of members of parliament saying that if we do that, we also become responsible. That is to touch upon your question there. Perhaps it's the best solution if it's only the minister that knows, and the Danish justice minister and the Danish prime minister definitely knows uh, that I'm uh, certain about that 110 percent. What what our intelligence agencies are doing and which cooperation they're having with other uh, countries' intelligence services. They, they know and they can, answer, they can get an answer on any question they want. But that also means that they are completely 110% responsible. Uh, and there's, there's some parliamentarians. 
uh, uh, that uh, perhaps the best solution is that it's the minister who knows everything and then it's also the minister that's responsible uh, for everything and not an oversight committee in, in the parliament that knows a number of things but really can't respond and then indirectly becomes responsible for some of the agreements that, that are made. Um, and um, um, I think I that's my point. I feel a whole new point, season yeah. of Borgen coming up, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, that, that's, uh, that's a good TV show, so I can definitely recommend that. It's not reality, though. Uh, it's not, uh, but it's, it's, very, uh, it's very good. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a pity. I, have, I had a member of, we have a, a lot of members from the Nordic countries coming to Denmark, uh, fellow members of parliament, saying we want to be members of parliament in Denmark because we've been in Borgen, and it's very interesting. It's, it's boring here in Sweden and Norway. And, Unfortunately, we have to tell them that it's also a little bit boring sometimes in Denmark. But actually, I think I answered the, the questions, hopefully, uh, and I just have one thing that I can, um, can, uh, can perhaps finish with, and that is uh, the question about, uh, um, uh, about the cooperation, that I think it's very important that there's uh, a good cooperation, and I, I think that... We will definitely use the report that, that uh, uh, this committee is, is finishing with and, and, and hopefully can help follow up on some of the, the recommendations in a, in a Danish context. But I also think that there's a potential for building uh, an alliance with some of the big companies like Facebook, Google, because they're definitely not interested in, in intelligence services regardless of which countries they are taking their uh, data from their users and, and being under the law obliged to, to, to hand it over. So, so I've, I think there's also a way there to go to make a cooperation with Facebook, Google when it comes to statistics on how many times intelligence service uh, and authorities and others are asking them to deliver uh, some of their, uh, their, their data uh, from, the, from the users. So, so there's two ways to go here. Thank you. Thank you. We're gradually coming to the end. Mr. De Decker. Uh, thank you, madame. Um, nous vivons dans un monde, un monde qui a discuté. Well, there's no doubt that we're living in a dangerous world and that those uh, threats are ever changing. Ten years ago, nobody were talk was talking about uh, cyber attacks. Uh, now it's becoming a bit of an obsession for our governments. And this isn't just the case for Europe or, or NATO. Think about the uh, number of uh, attacks from the uh, Chinese or, or other countries who've been found out. I think that demonstrates uh, the case. The problem is that uh, we in Europe uh, are continuing to deal with defense and security issues on a national basis. And if we don't change that, and if we don't really move towards uh, a European defense and security policy, a Europe-wide policy, we will be more and more vulnerable. Unfortunately, there are countries who've been powers for thousands of years, like France and Britain, who believe, and perhaps naive enough to continue to believe, that they're still superpowers. And they're no longer superpowers faced with this kind of threat. But they persist in thinking that they can deal with these matters at a purely national level. Um, I was uh, the uh, president of the, of the, uh, of the WO and I uh, was uh, able to deal with, uh, with the uh, of defense issues at that time. And then uh, the WEU was closed down and all the uh, um, powers of the Western European Union were transferred to the EU. Now, the result of all that was that um, national parliamentarians who were represented uh, in the uh, um, the, uh, that organization uh, were properly informed and um, ministers would come to the assembly in Paris and, uh, and talk about those issues. Uh, now uh, the EU has uh, powers over this and one can understand that. There's no real integration but there is uh, a competence, there are powers for the EU and the European Parliament. And the European Parliament and the defence uh, people from national par parliaments meet uh, twice a year. I think uh, Mrs. A Lady Ashton came along for five minutes, Mr. Rasmussen came along. But this is not at all what we used to have uh, in Western Europe. We're far less well informed than before. 
And I think uh, if we're uh, talking about building up European defence, I think we're actually back peddling. We're back back uh, tracking. And, and in fact, in the face of this kind of threat, we should be moving more quickly. And we need to uh, resist those who are not prepared to accept the integration of uh, defence and security issues in, in Europe. And it could be done. Now, I may have been being a bit... Um, pessimistic, saying that intelligence services think they're above uh, their governments and more important. Uh, no, obviously, uh, it's better that they should be uh, checked by both governments and parliaments, and I'm sure um, they, uh, they have to report back to their governments because any slip-ups, any accidents could cost their governments dear. I'm sure that the intelligence services are well aware of that and they report back um, and they are in contact with each other. Uh, civilian intelligence services, also the military intelligence services, uh, report back and share information in NATO. I mean, there were submarine uh, cables, incidentally, yeah, which was discovered. That was discovered uh, when the Echelon affair was um, discovered. The U.S. and the U.K. had agreed to check on Soviet uh, submarines uh, crossing the Atlantic, and they used those um, undersea cables. Um, using uh, the same system as uh, with the satellite uh, links, and that's how Echelon came about, and then we've got PRISM. Nothing's new under the sun. It's the same old thing. But we really do need to um, move quickly towards further um, European integration. People dream of, of, of national sovereignty, particularly the, uh, the uh, older and big uh, member states, and they have to realize that they're not safe. There has to be collective security. And if you look at cyber attacks and uh, bugs and um, hacking, we cannot necessarily respond to that at national level. And we may be the victims of uh, the uh, bugging uh, or the eavesdropping of a, of a neighboring country in Europe. And that will mean that people will start mistrusting each other. That's going to undermine confidence within the EU. And that's very damaging for the future of the Union. So I think we have to build confidence again amongst ourselves, uh, simply by, um, by f further integrating. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, we mustn't dismantle Europe as a result of this kind of thing. There is a bit of a shock effect at the moment. Uh, people are so horrified. Uh, governments uh, uh, may um, be too aggressive, and this might actually damage uh, the future of Europe. Mr. Rappay, uh, you want to add anything? You have to, you're the last speaker, so... I doesn't, don't have anything to add to what Mr. De Decker said already on the subject. The question that you might wish to answer as a, in conclusion of this session is the question on what could be the follow-up to the, the, the Brussels Declaration. I was involved in the creation of... Uh, this forum of parliamentary control on the intelligence service a number of years ago, and we were happy to see that uh, year on year countries have joined us. So through this conference of uh, countries that have a system of parliamentary oversight, we have managed to keep things moving forward and making progress. Now, with what has happened now, we hope that in the various parliaments who have this form of oversight, this will lead to joint initiatives which uh, could um, be the result of the, the work that we do at, at upcoming meetings. I think we've been always more satisfied at each meeting than we were at the previous one. We've managed to make progress every time in the work that we do, but there's still a long way to go. And I think I report coming from this committee could also have a very useful impact on the work that we are doing there. Perhaps I could just add something to that. You made a reference several times to the meeting and the Brussels Declaration, which dates from September, October 2010. The next meeting will be in Bonn in October. Or, uh, the following meeting was in October 2012. 10, sorry, in 2011-2012, we didn't have any meetings. I think what you could do is relaunch the whole process and ensure that the parliamentary committees or equivalent committees in the European Union can meet again and have a, an exchange 
Mr. De Decker has um, talked about the progress that has been made. I attended a number of the conferences, not all of them, of course, and I think that uh, the the level of trust was growing all the time. At the meeting in Bonn, it was the first time that the parliamentarians really had a significant exchange on the subject of what kind of rules do we need to agree on together to put an end to what is known as the third party service rule. Can we not envisage the possibility of uh, this rule no longer being invoked by a national intelligence service in the EU if the information is coming from another European Union member state? That is something that could be done as well. It's uh, a rule which uh, is, is important and would need to be kept, but it needs to be nuanced. And I think that uh, your committee can play and should play an important role in relaunching that process. If we look at how services work when they meet on a bilateral level, we can look at that as well. But I think that the impetus needs to, for greater oversight, needs to come from the national parliaments and from the European Parliament. So we're placing great hopes in you. It brings us to the end of our meeting, unless you have a. Uh Pressing need to make a last statement. Just to say that these Thursday sessions are particularly difficult for yeah. everyone, including our staff and so on, because uh, MEPs have to catch trains and planes, which we have to do. And I uh, just want to thank everyone for their attention. It's just logistically difficult, and I want to thank the speakers um, for that. And just register my final disappointment, Chair, that um, to our Danish colleague that. Um, in the United Kingdom, we thought Borgen was real, and, and we think it was a do documentary. <laughs> so I just want to register my disappointment that it's not real. No, 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 you got it all wrong. Yes, Prime Minister was real. Borgen is fiction. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much for being there. Thanks to the interpreters. And uh, the next session will be Monday evening in Strasbourg. Thank you. <laughs>